Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Tuesday. It's the Jeff Gersman Show. I'm Jeff Gersman, joined by Arthur Geese. How's it going, man? Oh, not bad. You know, it's kind of Monday, kind of not. Yeah, I. Uh, it's it's working from home. These holidays start to mean like nothing, but we actually took the kids out to a park and did a ton of stuff yesterday, and I was convinced all day it was Sunday, and so it's been a very confusing couple of days. Yeah, this this weekend was nice here because, you know, every the way the weather has worked out in New York is that like every weekend has been cloudy for like tw- or like 12 of the last 14 weeks has nice. been cloudy. Yeah. But somehow we we came around and this weekend it was really nice on Friday, Saturday and Sunday and then just absolutely horrible yesterday. So, mm. it's for the troops. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were they were sad for the troops. It's understandable. Yeah. So you're uh, you're with the wire. I mean, you've been all over the place. You're currently been at the, with the wire cutter for a while. You're like, uh, I imagine you just have like a bunch of fake doors there, and you're testing smart locks over and over again. You know, we do actually have a wire cutter office. That's like the bottom floor is like intermittently full of mattresses or treadmills. There's a test kitchen. Sometimes when I go into that mm-hmm. office, it smells like French fries or like various other fried foods and that's not bad yeah i like that's the the that that's the test food they have to come up with like we need to cook this food in every single one of these with on every single one of these devices what is it french fries it's got to be french fries we had a test kitchen that like back when i was in an office uh there was a, a test kitchen there that like had fallen into disrepair or was t- like totally not used no it's like and haunted. So, yeah, it, it totally felt kind of haunted. It was like dark and there was like a lot of nice equipment left in there. So we'd kind of like slip in there and we're like, I don't know, man, you want to sous vide something or get it like a, this camera is way nicer than ours. Like we should oh, really. We don't go in there. Yeah. <laughs> like don't remove anything from the room. Um, And at some point someone actually totally ransacked it and, and we couldn't even shoot in there anymore after that, I think. But they're um, dead now, though. Yeah, so, exactly. Yes. Yeah. The, the It started their fingers started burning one day. And uh, their corpse smelled like French fries. So kind of worked out, kind of worked out. Um, We're kind of on the cusp here of summer games fest now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, you're also the host of Rebel FM, a long running video game podcast and among among other things. So you're you're getting ready to head out there, I think, as am I. How's it looking for you this year? What do you what are your thoughts on it? Last year I felt like it was a pretty good easygoing show with some decently big games between like, you know, I don't know, Mortal Kombat and Alan Wake and a few other things. It it felt like a good show. Sure. Uh I think there will be some some bigger stuff there. Um I think my my gut is hoping that the big games there this year do better at retail than they did last year um (laughs) i you know it's it's funny because i think that there are more people going more people are sort of committed to this being the thing right Mm -hmm. um in part because keely really as as much trash as people talk has gone out of his way to make it easy for for publishers and developers to actually show their games without spending several hundred thousand dollars yeah um and there will be faces there that haven't been at one of these before and i think that's all encouraging but yeah i kind of I'm not sure what we're going to see this year. And so I feel a little less excitement and a little bit just more like open curiosity. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's one of those things that's, it's nice that I live in the area now because I can just drive down. I think with where I'm at on a lot of it, like if, if it was a plane trip with young kids and whatever else, I think it would like the calculus for me would be a little different and be like, "Mm, there's no like immediate, it's like a, a handful of things that I'm very excited to see. Like, I don't want to like undersell the, sure. the show or anything like that. Um, but it would be like a little more iffy this year than it probably was for me last year. Probably just, it, it's probably just a mortal Kombat thing, honestly. And foam stars. I mean, I, I liked foam stars. Foam stars. <laughs> foam is all stars right. is fun. Foam stars. I don't know. Yeah. Perfectly you know, I don't know playable. Their... Never had a chance. Yeah. Uh, but that was a curious business plan they had for that game but i don't know it was a good time yeah i i had a lot of fun in that demo session and then came away from it going like this game this game's got like six days to make a dent or something and uh yeah and then it's you know it did not its fate is kind of sealed so yeah yeah, i still not as it turns out make a dent i still have the duck they gave out for foam stars around here somewhere um 
of course the xbox showcase is going to become like i guess one of the cornerstones of this thing everyone has their events like around it right i mean but you know okay. just, just like e3 but xbox seems like the one that is like they always get out ahead of it a lot sooner uh than than everybody else and we're still waiting to see if sony's gonna cough up anything this week or next or or, or try to to do anything but which seems pretty likely although you know it's it's like after one here it's early where you are so maybe there's yeah. still time for them to announce something but like a silent hill thing got announced for thursday and a silent hill right. which is not a playstation exclusive or is a yeah. playstation exclusive can't do that at playstation's thing i don't know what's happening yeah right if they're well maybe it's such a big show that they just like sorry we don't have room for silent hill so they just kind of crash announced their maybe they got cut from the show late maybe they did yeah maybe it, that's it's so full such a jam-packed so show. jam-packed we've got a that, that's where that's where the, all the call of duty stuff is gonna end up being is the playstation that, that that's i mean going by previous years that's clearly what's gonna happen right exactly yes um but i think a lot of eyes are on uh are on microsoft right now for a zillion different reasons um what are you uh, do you think there's anything that can come out of this showcase that is going to like change the vibe around my the hand ringing the like oh my god the sky is falling the these guys are doomed like there's just varying degrees of doom and gloom surrounding that brand online do you think there's anything that they could say right now that would change that um the simple answer is no I don't, yeah. I don't think it's, I don't know, but I don't necessarily think that that's down to Xbox. I think that there is like a malaise around the industry mm. and that they, you know, certain things, definitely they deserve criticism for, but other things, I think that they have become a punching bag for a general worry about the video sure. games industry. And until someone else screws up in a way that like really attracts <laughs> a lot of ire, yeah. I think that they will continue to be the sort of punching bag for that regardless of what they show and i fully expect that they're going to show a lot of pretty cool stuff and they have so many games in development right now um but i don't, he, I don't well know. yeah uh i i think i'm at a point with it and and I, you're right I, I think like sony has really benefited by just shutting the fuck up through a lot of this stuff you know for and, now for now yes but I, I i do think that when they start talking yeah, we'll see but yeah um, i you know, you know like i i think that the thing that that like b bugs me a little bit is that every xbox thing has to be the thing that fixes it that like right. fixes it and it's like i there was no way that hellblade was ever gonna fix it like you know totally. even if Hellblade got like 90s like it wasn't gonna fix it no it's a, it's like a five to eight hour like mostly walking narrative game like if that's not the problem um yeah so uh, what could they show i don't i don't know like what could they possibly say other than grand theft auto 6 exclusively on xbox <laughs> right yeah uh it, it's a weird it is yeah it, it just feels like they they have ended up in a very weird spot i think as a result of i don't it's, it's certainly some mismanagement on their part but i think a lot of the um the hand wringing around the multi-platform announcement and the stuff leading up to that as those leaks started to happen. Like if someone internally was trying to like win a fight by leaking information, I think they damaged the, the brand, if nothing else, like not yeah. in a way that probably impacts sales hugely, but like the, the, they, they fucked up the narrative real bad around, around a lot of that stuff. And, uh, and they haven't, I don't know. It's totally it feels like they haven't recovered. And I heard various things about the sort of sources of, the, of those leaks. And some of them, you know, some of them are calls coming from inside the house. Some of them are yeah. calls coming from the guest house. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sure. I, I just, I don't, I don't like, what do you, what, what do you want from this? That, that's what, so that's the question I've been asking myself a lot lately, you know, like, cause you know, there's been talk that gears is going to finally show up. And I feel like three or four years ago, if you said, Hey, they're finally getting ready to announce the new gears. I've been like, Oh, great. Because in the back of my mind, I still think about those Xbox 360 days and those core franchises, right? It's the Forza, Gears, Halo, like that kind of triumvirate. And, you know, you get like Fable peppered in when appropriate. Um, 
And that just feels like from a completely different industry, a totally different business when you think about it now. So I, I look at that and go like, yeah, they should absolutely make a new, new a new gears because that story is still hanging for the whoever cares about wrapping up the the story strings in a gears game. I you know I, I want to she's got the thing on her neck. She's the queen. She's related to the queen. We have to. But I said the same thing about Cortana and the the way that they addressed that in Halo Infinite felt like a team came in and said. I uh, felt quite literally like a team came in and said, oh, we have to address this, but let's address it as quickly as possible so that we can move on and not have to make a whole game about it. Yeah, um, I think Halo is in a different position than Gears a little bit because there are so many people who like different things about Halo. Yeah. That like 343 just like never, I mean, honestly, Bungie never really managed this after Halo 2 either. But uh, it's so many things to so many different people. It's tough to know what people want or what to give them. Right. Um, I think the thing with Gears to remember, and I hope that Microsoft remembers this when they think about how it's supposed to perform, there's a reason that Epic sold Gears to Xbox, which is that that was a series that never managed to break like the six or seven million mark. And sure. yeah. even when that was in development, Tim Sweeney was very forthright about the fact that these games are, their budgets are increasing exponentially and every game does about the same. So like at a certain point, why are we doing this anymore? Right. Um, which is because we have this engine business that seems to be doing okay. Yeah. Um, this is even before Fortnite. Um, and yeah, and they always treated it as like, well, Gears is going to come out and show here's here's what the Unreal Engine can do. And yeah. they, they always said, well, we don't consider an iteration of the engine done until we've shipped a game on it. And which is still largely yeah. true. Unreal Engine 5 wasn't really ready until they shipped Fortnite on it. So. Right. Um, I don't like, and I think that Gears is considered a boomer franchise and rightly so because it gained popularity. I'm sorry in advance. 18, no, yeah. yes. 18 years ago. Jesus. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry for violence on a Tuesday. Uh, no, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And so th th that's when I think about numbers like that, I think about like, oh, how much could gears matter to them in this day and age? Like how many people are left like of, of that number that was never quite high enough to, to really break through in the first place. How many of those people are actually left to really properly enjoy a new gears game or care about a new gears game? Yeah. Um, and I also, I just think that like, we're at a point where there's real quadruple a panic setting in basically everywhere. Like it's not, it's and to a point where the big quadruple a release isn't moving the needle anymore. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think that Sony is satisfied with how Spider-Man has helped its PlayStation five sales. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, obviously there's, there hasn't been like a big game for Xbox to attach itself to. And now that there might be, I think it might be too late. Like, I wonder if this generation is just like cooked and again, right. not just for Xbox, like Xbox is obviously like the leading indicator rather than the trailing indicator of the problems mm -hmm. that like this business is having. But like, if Spider-Man selling two million units like isn't enough for Sony, then like what the hell does Gears success look like to Xbox? Because if they're thinking ten million units, then they need to like seriously recalibrate what that looks like. Yeah, and especially with you know, they're not even really you know units can't even ever be the same anymore because of Game Pass and and everything. Like like a lot of that math right. has has completely changed for them. Yeah, you know, I think one of the one of the most frequent sentiments I get in email from listeners to this show um is this general feeling of like hey this generation feels like it hasn't started yet or like i just feel like i just bought a like as the the ps5 pro talk started ramping up it was a lot of people saying like i feel like i just bought or I just was able to buy a ps5 and 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 have not yet or or just did and, you know, I'm not really finding a ton of games that I really want to play. Like, it's it's a really, it, it feels bad. Like, the console space just kind of feels bad right now. And not to say that there's nothing yeah. to play or whatever. Like, I, th I think that, you know, if you're going out and spending $500 on a console, like, you're going to find games if, if, you're, if that's the, the sole place where you're focused on playing. But, yeah, I don't know. That, that's a very frequent thing. Uh, piece of feedback I get written into this show is people going like this generation seems like it never got off the ground and now they're telling us that the PS5 is on the back half of its lifespan what are we even doing well good news because I don't think that the next generation of consoles is going to feel like a new generation of games <laughs> great uh, 
I like you, you know, like I I believe that a new Xbox will come in 2026. I don't think they're going to talk about that this year. I think it would be silly too. Um, but I don't. They're not going to cut off the Series X and the Series S. Just like you know, we'll talk about it later. Like major games this fall will continue to support the PS4 and Xbox One. Right. People aren't leaving those systems behind. Yeah. Um, and that was the number I saw Steven Totillo talking about as part of the the Sony um, financials was this idea that almost half of their monthly active users were still on PlayStation 4. Yeah. And I hadn't really considered that. So it was something of an eye opener. Just like, oh, right. Yeah. It's... Well, which is, you know, which is one reason why Spider-Man is like the first serious PlayStation 5 exclusive since Returnal. Sure. Yeah. I think I don't really count the last of us part one in that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you can, if you want, um, you know, like there haven't been a ton of PS five exclusives because it doesn't make sense. And yeah. there must be somebody at Sony saying like, why did we not make this game for PlayStation four? Like how many more copies of Spider-Man two could we have sold? How much more of that rev share with Disney would we have offset by releasing this on PS four? Um, right. and I don't, I don't see that changing for next generation so like when the ps6 comes out i think that it'll be way nicer looking versions of ps5 games so you um, think we're sticking same same architecture you don't think anyone's going to make the jump to arm and, and try to do anything really crazy you think it'll just be know, like hey here's another here's another tech bump i don't i it's tough because i don't think that like i have so many powerful arm devices in my apartment mm -hmm. like i have an m3 macbook pro and i go to apple events and see them show games yeah and when they show stuff like Death Stranding, for example, on powerful Macs, it's running at like PS4 settings at under 60 frames per second. Yeah. And those are really expensive pieces of hardware. Um, I don't think that we're there yet with ARM. Mm -hmm. um, it is significantly more efficient, but it's not as performant. Um, and I don't know what success they've had driving up wattages. There are still a lot of scenarios where x86 is just better. Right. Um, and so... I don't, I, I personally don't think that arm is going to be there for mm. 2026 or 2028. If that's yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess when we start talking reasons. about this in terms of like a year and a half, yeah, I guess, or, or two and a half years, I guess we're thinking yeah. holiday, but, uh, yeah, I guess that, that is, that is not that far away. Yeah, it's not. And the thing is that if there's a system coming out in 2026, they are walking down the hardware now. Right. Um, and even with Sony, like I don't. Sony expended a lot of effort to make the PS4 library compatible with the PS5. They did. Mm -hmm. And I, I see a lot of people saying like backwards compatibility is magic. You just hit a button and basically it all works. Like, no, all that stuff takes a lot of work as evidenced by the fact that stuff was broken when it launched. Yeah. There was, there was someone on, on discord that like noticed that like, cause Hellblade one shipped on PS4 and you can't find it on the PS5 web store because it's not fully like you can, you can go on like the, or I'm sorry, you can go on the web and find it in that store. You can't find it on console because it apparently has graphical glitches that never got fixed right? Uh, um, on PS5. And so there's still a handful of games, of course, that are... To say, it's nothing of like what Xbox is doing with their backwards compatibility, which like is just miles ahead of everybody else as far as like the kind of support that it gives. And so, you know, I if you're talking about stuff I'd like to see at the show, like other than games, like yeah. people have wanted a backwards compatibility update for a while. Yeah. And now there are all these Call of Duty games right? that what if they actually ran well again on an mm -hmm. Xbox series? And honestly, what if they, you know, threw a bone to PlayStation owners that way too? I don't know. Um, I just, like, I want to see stuff like that. And then there are games that I want to see too, but it's... Yeah, it's I, I agree it's with like you on the backwards there. compatibility stuff. Or was, every, every time they announce, and they've I guess they've only done it really twice now, but both times that they've said, like, we're winding down our back compat efforts for this generation. I always go like, ah. but like, I get it. You know, like at some point, the licensing, like the, the games that are left, like the big games that people would want that are left, like so many of them come with, whether it's licensed music or, or other things that would prevent them from just being straight up sold on console. Um that it's kind of a at some point it's diminishing returns from a business standpoint like even 50 cent blood on the sand you can't if you have the disc you can put it in yeah but they never went and resold it digitally i imagine because it, you know they would have to renegotiate a bunch of stuff to yeah. do that again because thq doesn't even exist and and whatever else um whatever else they would need to do it's like the dogma of video games that's what you're saying <laughs> exactly that is yes exactly <laughs> 
uh, uh both but, in terms you know, of quality and in terms of no. um there's stuff like like all of Valve's games from the 360 are backwards compatible and actually run at like 4k but they're mm-hmm. you can't buy i don't think you can buy all of them digitally um yeah i yeah I, I remember i was looking at a list at some point i think you're right that 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 was that was on there um that stuff's that stuff is weird uh yeah i, I would love to see like if it's not going to be a full-on uh hey here's the reveal of the hardware i would love to at least see some and, and they usually make room for this somewhere in there some kind of platform update some kind of here's an initiative we're going to push for the next nine months or whatever just to have something on the the console side like yeah. even I would love to see him redesign the front end of the Xbox again. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like the front end works pretty well, but I I think that the the Xbox always the series consoles always suffered from a lack of that like new car smell with like yeah. a better dashboard. And I, the PlayStation Five UI was not great initially, but it was still fun. Um, like <laughs> yeah. it's neat to see new stuff, and I think that that's like a key part of it. But I, I don't know. I I don't. I think that Xbox is very committed to pursuing handheld for the same reason everyone else is because handhelds are not going after a new market so much as they are looking to sell to their existing market like it's Mm -hmm. an upsell for an existing customer base um you know like the ps portal is the most obvious example of that you can't do anything with it without a ps5 right but like most people who buy steam decks aren't new to steam like there are people with huge Mm -hmm. steam libraries um and it's a way to get you spending more money and just like the ps5 pro isn't going to expand the audience on its own but everybody that gets a ps5 pro is going to hand their ps4 down to somebody who or ps5 to someone who doesn't have it right you now um except for me who will put it in a garage and yes, uh well, or in me i have to keep them so we can do side by sides right. um so gotta keep them on low know. firmware you never know what's going to happen man yeah you know and that's like a <laughs> Which is another reason why I think the idea of like an open Xbox platform that runs Windows next generation is kind of a silly thing to say. That that's the other uh, that is the other big email I've been getting, uh, and it's something that I I even kind of I think in the middle of talking about this stuff a month or two ago said like oh, wouldn't it be cool if they decided to just open up the Xbox? But I think like their their business would have to become so dire from like a subscription or just like services standpoint for them to be willing to give up uh, I, that kind of ground. Um, so for, I think making it totally open the way windows is open is wouldn't happen for that reason. Yeah. Um, I do think allowing other app store app stores within the ecosystem is something that probably will, but not necessarily for the reason that like, Oh, it gets people more invested in Xbox. I think it is a regulatory thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, e- even if, even if they're not feeling the heat from it, it at least helps them paint a good picture in whatever fight they want to have with Apple, which Microsoft has been very aggressive about for like a decade now, like they got spanked super hard and now they're all about looking like the good guys to government organizations, which is one reason why I think that they were so surprised at the pushback at the Activision Mm -hmm. deal. Um, cause they were the good ones. We, we talk to you guys all the time. We're open. We're pushing Linux. Like we're funding Linux development. Like we can run Unix stuff and like nobody uses that shit on windows (laughs) yeah but you can i've got docker Uh, desktop running on a server machine there's some linux happening there's dozens of you yes um but i i think it's more about appearing open than it is being open um so that they can say look we do it or so apple more specifically can't say nobody else is doing it right you know um but yeah i you know i a handheld would be nice handheld mode on stuff would be nice but like an open Xbox would be such a massive piracy risk that I yes. can't, I can't and, and see they've that been, ever happening. They've, I, I think about this a lot. Like they've, they've somehow been the company that has avoided any sort of like custom firmware jailbreak hacking situation now for a couple of generations. Like there was a, a couple of minor things. I remember when the Xbox One launched, there were guys in Brazil swapping hard drives between machines. Yeah. Um, and a, a few things like that. But in terms of just the wide open, like, let's install some real bad shit. Like I did to my Wii yep. U over the weekend, which now I can play. Uh, I can I can once again play Mario Maker 1 online. Sort Perfect. of. 
it's not it doesn't work quite as well as it should but mario and the cd underbelly of the internet exactly open source servers and all this other weird stuff it's uh it's cool but it's not you know um yeah. i think but the they, they've somehow managed to dodge a lot of that uh nah, guess... it's, there's so there's been some there's stuff that they very quickly patch and so you have a okay. lot of people that are like I, I don't i don't know who does this i i wouldn't well, you have people out there that are like either buying a second PS5 and then keeping it unupdated in case, just in case there's some firmware thing someday. Yeah. Which I, I don't like, you have to be really dedicated to someday maybe pirating games. I, I don't know. Like everything's server based now. I think the idea of like piracy in games is so crazy to me now. Um, I think you and I have both lived in different realities where we had significantly more time than we did money for video absolutely. games. Yes. So there will always be those people. Yeah. Yes. So I think that the, there will always be a desire for piracy, but I think that I, the, the Xbox one and the, the series consoles have serious security lockdown stuff in place, but they also have some goodwill with the open source community because right. of dev mode stuff. Yeah. Um, but the second that you let anybody install any OS that they want to, or any apps that they want to on the console, like either you permanently lock down disk access so they can't get into that or mm -hmm. you can't run games that way. I just right. don't, it doesn't strike me as, as like practical and third parties I don't think would be thrilled. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an Xbox handheld. I, I don't know, man. I, I think that's what I have. I have a hard time envisioning that consumer, but I guess the, like the, for, to the audience that's out there, like really loving game pass and really living on game pass. The idea of having a, a dedicated handheld that doesn't have streaming as, as part of the equation would probably be pretty appealing to that crowd. I just, you know, when you talk about Xbox hardware and how little it seems to be selling and everything, it's like, is there enough people that fit that description to really make that scenario work? There could you know? be if it played 360 games. Mm. Well, I, I mean, are you talking like discs or are you talking... <laughs> That would be awesome. That'd be sure. awesome. But like, it's but like, a disc I, I, man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, because, you know, it's it, surely it will be backwards compatible in the same way that the current consoles yeah. are. And, and so, yeah, you would get your 360 games that way or, or as much as you have of your digital library as they could manage to cram on there. Um, but like, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, the, the handheld stuff to me, you know, I, I have almost all of them. Um, the mm -hmm. only one I don't have is the MSI thing, which I guess I haven't made anyone mad enough to have that sent to me. Um, <laughs> like I, I think that everybody is, is saying they're very enthusiastic about that category. And to me, it's starting to feel a little bit like everybody's saying they're jumping into AI with everything. Sure. It sounds like they're latching onto this as something to point to with investors and say, look, we're going to try to grow the market. And also as a feel good thing to consumers who want it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I just don't, we're not there yet. And the thing that Nintendo demonstrated with the switch is the best thing they could possibly do is make it so that any game anyone is making is both a, a like a home console game and a portable game, right? Like you don't have to split your dev resources and that games are just so expensive to make at this point. But, yeah. And, and the idea of like, you know, if, if we, if we take some of the dev grumbling that's been going around at face value and, and, and say like, Oh, well some developers are wondering why they're bothering to ship on Xbox, let alone tune for two separate SKUs. You throw a third at them and now, okay, okay, now, you know, make sure that it runs well on this handheld also, uh, you know, is that going to be enough to make them go like, all right, you know what? We're deprioritizing Xbox even further at this point. Cause it's all just right. not moving units but at this point you also have square saying actually the ps5 install base isn't big enough for us sure yeah no one's so, uh, yeah i mean for the for the price of game development i guess they need as many yeah. it's like a weirdly bigger version of what vr has been going through for years where they're just like we're desperate to ship on anything we can can you okay we'll make it not in vr i don't care like will someone buy this game yeah um so i guess maybe we're entering that era where no one can afford I, to be exclusive I mean, I, I desperately hope we're not in the VR because I think like the main problem there is that it's a product that most people just fundamentally don't want. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a separate issue. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, I, I think that just to go back to the original topic for a second is that like 
there are questions about the industry that are being laid at Microsoft's feet that they can't answer because nobody can answer them. Yeah. And so I don't, I, everything that Xbox does, people are like, well, does this solve the problem? And there's no one thing they can do to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know if that means that they just have to keep grinding or if it means they're screwed and also everybody else is screwed two years from now. Sure. Um, I so, imagine the Xbox answer gets answered at a different corporate level. Like that's how much, how much yeah. rope are we willing to give this division at this point? I mean, they already went and spent all that money on Activision. So clearly they're going to let them try to make something happen with all this stuff that they've gone out and acquired. But, and we'll see like what that looks like this fall, because obviously today they dropped the, the news that people have been waiting for, but was contested, which is that, you know, Call of Duty will be on game pass right. and that's potentially a big deal and that they might retool game pass, which is desperately needed. Um, yeah, because which they just, they just, it felt like they just retooled it to get rid of Xbox live gold. And now it's like yeah, the remnants was, of that need to change. I it's last July. And I, you know, the, the, the baggage there is charging for multiplayer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's ultimately when we get it, like, why isn't there an open Xbox? why that that runs all this other stuff i think that's got to be a big part of it too you know they don't want to throw that money away it's still it's still too much for them to just like toss out and just sure. be like oh, okay yeah we're just yeah just install steam whatever like it's it's too it would be way too crazy um i think that they they'd get some feel good points if they announced fallout stuff Right now, it seems like I, I bet that there's some push to like, is there anything we can say about Fallout at this thing? Because right now is the time. Can we remaster? What can we what can we push out there? Yeah. Um, that has been really, I, and it, it, this feels like the first time it happened for real. Like that's always the promise. It's like, oh, the Sonic movie comes out and it reignites interest in this or Last of Us, which it did to some extent. But I feel like the the interest in fallout four specifically 76 as well, but like, yeah, but, um, but the, the increased interest in fallout four in the wake of that TV show has been really like remarkable to see. It's like, it's finally, it's finally happened where like a TV thing came out and really actually helped a franchise. Um, yeah, it was like the Witcher is the only other example I can think of. Where oh, there sure. was like yeah, a, yes. a notable yes. change right. in perception, but you know, like there have been rumors of a fallout three remaster for a long time. Yeah. Um, as well as an Oblivion remaster for a long time. And um I love Fallout 3. Give me an excuse to play it again. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but also if you are giving other studios, Bethesda Game Studio games to remake or remaster, that is also like a crash course in how you make those games. It's like Fallout school, basically. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's or BGS school, if you prefer. And I think yeah. that that's like one of the, the first major steps you have to take because Bethesda game studios in Bethesda, Maryland is not going to go past like 300 people. Like there's yeah. not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would suggest to me that, you know, maybe they understand it or, you know, announcing that you formed a team to work on a new fallout game yes. with nothing to announce now, no name to announce now, but there is a new fallout game in development. Like mm -hmm. I think that would make people happy. Yeah. That, that would make a lot of sense. You, you do that alongside, a remaster announcement to kind of tide people over or give, give people something to chew on. Um, I, you know, it'd be great to see new Vegas. Yeah. And the, the rumor wrap, wrap that in this stuff, as the well. rumor that was going around a little bit was that like new Vegas two was something that Bethesda sure. would be cool with as opposed to fallout five. Right. Um, I, now you have a TV show that's Canon that takes place after mm -hmm. those games. And that complicates things a little bit, but, um, well, there's still wiggle room, right? There's still some number of years that you could cram a new Vegas two in and potentially bridge that narrative gap between what the fuck happened to Vegas that it's dead in the TV show, but still yes. here. So like there's kind Where of there's a, a will, made. there's a way for exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I would love to see them then do as much as I had my problems with a fallout four launch. I would love to see them do something. Oh, did you not like fallout four? Did I miss that conversation? <laughs> Yeah, not a huge fan. Not a, not a huge fan. Not a huge fan of the. Uh, had a couple problems. Had, had some issues. I play, I mean, I should again say I they I played it on PlayStation Four, right? Which, is, uh, which yeah. was a, a, a big source of the problems. Um, not that it was super clean on PC at launch, but hey. Um, 
And then there's been a, a kind of some persistent talk about uh, a new Doom going all the way back to the PowerPoint presentation that came out in court. They called it Year Zero. Now we've got a name going around Doom the Dark Ages. Uh, and then some dude on Twitter saying it's going to launch on PS5. To be fair, multiple dudes on Twitter now. I'm sorry, multiple dudes. Uh, multiple Twitter dudes are saying it's going to be, be on PS5. That, that's the fun part about this time of year. And, and honestly, I think where a lot of things in this business have been heading is that the like dude on Twitter to real rumor pipeline is, uh, looking better all the time. Um, what were you a fan of the, of doom eternal? I was not a huge fan of doom eternal. I thought it was fine. Yeah. I liked doom 2016 a lot more, although I. I felt like Doom 2016 kind of runs out of gas about two thirds of the way through. Um, well, yeah, if you Doom... kill them with the chainsaw, the gas pops out for the more chainsaw kills. So you... that's in Doom Eternal. Oh, you're right. Right. I no, but but in Doom 2016, you just get the the red orb and just beat the shit out of guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like Doom 2016 more than Doom Eternal. Um, I didn't like the combat puzzle element because it felt like I was being forced to use weapons I didn't like. Yeah. Um. That was a game I like playing that at, I guess what would have been judges week back then. Jesus. Yeah. Um, I, I came away from that extremely positive about that aspect of the game because mm -hmm. in a demo situation, I think a lot of that stuff showed really well and that stuff stretched out to an ent entire game that also has a bunch of weird platforming in it. Yeah. Um, at some point it was like, this is like, they, they've taken this in a direction and I, I don't, much like it having having had like some marginal experience or like insight into like game development now than i've had so you've, you, you yeah well, well you've been you've been doing some consulting here and there yeah um i, th I guess i can say like a, a rough number like i when i left polygon i started doing consulting because i was going to grad school um and like over the course of my consulting span i i think i was on about 45 to 50 engagements um, mm. and sometimes that would be the same game more than once, but, um, uh -huh. I, certain things are just like the ways that developers make games longer because they're worried that a game isn't long enough. And doom eternal frequently felt like a game that was made longer to feel like a better value. Um, right. cause every <laughs> goddamn fight was in a room that would not open until you killed this many enemies. Um, yeah. and I like when it's a combat trial, it feels different. Cause then there's a timer and I'm like, I got to do awesome in this. I have a, I have motivation, but it got a little exhausting in doom eternal. Yeah. Um, and yeah, somebody in chat just said doom 2016 felt more like painkiller. Yes. It felt more like that era of game. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it felt truer to its roots in a lot of ways. And I guess like you make one of those and then you have to move on. If you're going to make another doom, you have to figure sure. out like, okay, what are we going to hang our hat on again? I just don't think that they chose, um, exciting, things and to to you, hang that game on you're also trying to solve for a problem which is that doom 2016 didn't sell amazingly well mm. um like i think eventually it got up to like six million units but that was after like heavy heavy discounts right um and it got discounted really fast um and i think that at that point you're like going back trying to think of like well we made this game that we reviewed super well like what the hell and yeah. you go to players and you're like what didn't you like about it and you're going to get so many different answers in that situation um, right and it's really hard to sort of course correct on something when you don't, when you made a good game that doesn't do well. Yeah. Um, like I, I don't, yeah, the, yes, I, I, that seems like an impossible problem to solve. We, I, we, yeah. we get a fair amount of questions about consulting. I, I don't, I don't, you know, obviously don't want you to get specific about you know sure. some of the stuff, but the way I've heard it described is that you're a person being brought in to solve an internal argument. Like they're almost looking for a neutral party to come in and go like, Hey, we think this game you we think you need to be able to you know do i don't know platforming and you know, like in this shooter like we we think this is a cool addition to this game this other side of the studio hates our guts what do you think here's some money i you know it can be that like there there have definitely been times where i've been in a room and i'm like oh they know or the, somebody knows like mm -hmm. what i'm going to say about this and somebody else disagrees and we're here to sort of like maybe give someone ammo to use in something else. Sometimes right. it's just a sanity check because, and you'll see this in a lot of like making of documentaries now, especially as, as they get more candid. Like yeah. I felt like 
the God of War 2018 documentary was actually very candid and I think mm. it's like a really good sort of view into how game making decisions are made. Um, I think that sometimes they think something is good, but something in the back of their head is like, we don't, we, all we do is play this game. Like we have no way to know, like we need somebody with fresh eyes to touch this and think like, is this good? Um, right. And sometimes like, it's a consultant coming in for a different consultant team to put fresh eyes on a project that they've been working on for a really long time. And they're like, we've been, we went around this too long. Mm -hmm. We need someone who hasn't seen this before to touch it. And I think that that's tough to do, especially in the modern era of leaks, like to get eyes on something from someone who hasn't seen it before. Right. Um, and so that's a lot of consulting. Um, but it, it kind of just depends on when you touch something. Like if you touch something, two months before release you're like this is what's going to happen <laughs> right yeah and this is how i would respond to it or how you can try to like hopefully shape a narrative that is more beneficial to you right um if you get it like a year in advance or even nine months in advance it might be like okay so this part i just don't think is working um mm -hmm. and you know do what you want but i think that this part is really going to drag the game down and it doesn't serve much of a purpose um and i've seen parts disappear from games mm -hmm. uh in the wake of those things um Sometimes it's just like the story really isn't clear. Like there's like this weird gap between sections where I don't understand how I got from here to here. Oh, and sure. if you tell someone yeah. that two months before it comes out, well, that's just what some people might say about it. If it's nine months or a year, yeah. then there might be time to fix it. Like we can um, add three lines of VO right here. That right. Exactly. And sometimes, gap. sometimes that's really all it takes. Yeah. It's just like a couple of lines of dialogue or a bark and it might seem inelegant, but like it's, that is the bridge that the player needed to get across from one point to another without getting lost. Mm. Um, and puzzles are another thing that I think they want consultants to look at, like just general design stuff. It's like, did this person get stuck? Did this person break the game? Oh, my doorbell mm -hmm. just rang, but I'm not going to answer it because I know okay. what it is. Um, so yeah, I, I think that a lot of times they're just looking for feedback. And sometimes um, I think I've, I've told the story before so I can tell it like, in the original Spider-Man, like I consulted on the 2018 Spider-Man, because um, mm -hmm. Insomniac are great. Uh, there was like a certain speed that Spider-Man would hit, and the they've I think that they've said this before that like the speed at which you can move through those worlds is determined by like access to the to the system. Like it was hard drive access in 2018. Right. Yeah. And one of the ways that they showed the new storage uh, on the PS5 before it came out was like zooming around that city like instantly. Yeah. Um, and that's like one of the ways that I think in Spider-Man two, once again, my doorbell is ringing. I'm not going to get it. It's okay. Uh, it's a, it's a air filter replacement for my oh. air purifier. So it's Very fine. Nice. I can go another day. Amazon. It's fine. Um, like basically they, the way they showed the PS five, like storage solution and how much better it was, is like, you could just like instantly zip to different parts of the city. Right. But in, in Spider-Man 2018, like if you swung too fast, you would actually outpace the ability of the game to generate collision. And if you fell to the ground at that point, you would fall into infinity. Right. Um, and so at that point, it's like, well, how do you keep that from happening? Yeah. And and not not everybody's going to do that. And I'm not like like hardcore, super pro gamer that is going to like break every game. But I'm good enough at games to find things that are just not going to work because the player can actually move faster than you think you can. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but some of that they probably find. Well, I guess by the time they're doing like focus tests and stuff, it's probably too late for something fundamental like that because usually like a, they're not going to bring focus tests in at least like for it, gameplay like large swaths of the public like hey let's get 40 people into this testing lab and do a thing like that's going to be later when they're a little more ready for a leak or something like that then, it like, really depends like again yeah. just going back to the god of war documentary they brought people in and basically had them in gray box rooms fighting enemies so oh, we're well, talking about, yeah. life, about it and i think that it's good to sort of get feedback early mm -hmm. um but also you know, sometimes that episode backfires and a consultant will say something that like is totally at odds with the game. Um, and you go in a direction you wouldn't have intended to, and it really screws you. And so it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and it, it, it's really given me even more of a respect for how hard games are to make. Yeah. Like they really, they frequently do really come together in the last couple of months. Um, which has got to be frustrating making them for sure that like, this is bad. 
please, please God, tell me this will get good. Right. Just every and, day you wake up and like, maybe today the game will be good. Yeah. Maybe someone will check in some kind of code that will make this thing not terrible. And sometimes it does. And sometimes yeah. it really doesn't. Um, yeah. 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 Um, it's terrifying. Yes. Especially as costs for everything go up and everything. I have to imagine the pressure on like any developer. You know, like even think about like some of these projects that, you know, got announced probably far too early, like a fable or perfect dark or something like that, where you're just like, okay, like how off the rails are these games that, you know, we haven't seen them and we haven't seen them. Um, and I imagine that's gotta be pretty nerve wracking. Um, yeah. I, on a lot of levels. Are leaks are weird man i just a little a little leak literacy would be great to see in the press more often than i see it just well it's, it's interesting because the, i feel like the press used to be you know when, when there was a healthy games press i think it was a lot of people who were in a lot of cases un, they understood what it was what it meant to see a game prior to release what it, what it meant to see a game that had not been optimized yet and what it meant to it, it it's it's why like when people say like oh all video game previews used to be positive or whatever it's like no they're written with a benefit of the doubt because you know there's aspects of it that are simply not there and you know you can't if you're if you come out of a preview session and and your main thing is like well the frame rate was terrible like okay that's one of the things that will change incredibly late in the game in a lot of cases so what you what's hope. yeah well yeah you hope um so like what value does that feedback have or what value does that give to the reader who is maybe going to pre-order a game to like, Hey, you know, nine months before this game came out, there was a bunch of debug menus in it and it didn't like, you know, like there's just that, that stuff. I feel like that when public, when publications were publications, um, you, generally speaking, you had people, even the junior people, you would kind of, the senior people would school them up on like, Hey, like, cut this out of your preview it, it's just not fair at this point to say that because we're talking about a game that is still you know maybe a year off or something like that and now it doesn't feel like there are that many senior people left in well, i was gonna say in newsrooms but like what what newsrooms are even left um, yeah i mean i honestly i feel like sites like ign do great with news like video games yeah. chronicle does great with news like there mm. are great people at polygon still like you know mike mcwarder's over there um yeah. there's there's great news at lots of places but the leaks aren't always coming from those places of course yes but uh, they're sometimes they're covering them i think it is the yeah. is the is the situation and so i think you have some people that come into contact with that information and right take it one way or the other and there's some people I trust on that. Like I think Tom Warren at the verge generally will not run with a leak rumor unless he has his own sources that he's just not like, comfortable disclosing. Um, right. But I like, there are lots of leaks that are kind of true and there are lots of leaks that are true until they're not true. Right. Um, you know, I think that what I would like to see is a little more skepticism as to the reason that you're being leaked a thing mm -hmm. because almost everybody, anybody who's talking about something they're not supposed to talk about has an agenda. Yes. And that might be, I like telling people secrets. That's an agenda. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've, I've people... known people like that over the years that were just like excited and they're just like, yeah. I, I'm working on this thing. You, you need to write about it. It's so cool. Yeah. And I, I've had people tell me things straight up like, Hey, I'm worried that EA is going to cancel this thing. If you don't write about it. if like, like if it doesn't leak out ahead of time and people are not excited about it, I think they're going to shut us down. Yeah, and those and, like that's you've been doing this long enough that I'm sure it's happened to you where you've talked to people whose games you've reviewed poorly that they said like or that you know that they lost their jobs because that game did badly. Yes. Yeah. Um and I've had the experience a couple times now of people like telling me to my face. <laughs> uh and that's always a tough moment. Um I just every leak is coming from someone with like an agenda and that may be you know the secret guy it may be an axe to grind like mm -hmm. it's not hard to look at the perfect dark thing and, and see that a lot of very senior people left very disgruntled yes about the move at that studio from a flat structure which having worked under flat structures is the worst idea i've ever heard um to a more regimented one which might also be dysfunctional mm -hmm. um but there are lots of people with lots of axes to grind and you know i that's 
if Xbox is leaving behind a lot of developers with a lot of access to grind, then that speaks to morale problems that they should probably deal with. Yeah. Um, but I would just like to see a little bit more sort of why from people like, why am I learning this? Why is this this way? Why is this story important? You know, just like as an example, yeah. last year, the story started to spin up that like, oh, you know, Best Buy is going to stop carrying physical Xbox games. And that was like kind of this, honestly, the start of like the Xbox press doom narrative. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out actually targets kind of not carrying anything from anybody anymore, except for Nintendo. Oh, and now like all these other places are also cutting their physical retail and it's not just Xbox. Right. Um, and it's like, I, 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 I want to know why something is when someone reports it, like why is perfect dark development in a rough state or like why this or why that, like why, did Tango get closed? Why did Arcane Austin get closed? Like why mm -hmm. those studios and not other studios? And I just don't see as much sort of digging into the whys as I'd like to see. Yeah, I think that that stuff, yeah, it's, yeah. We don't, there are, there are definitely good people out there still doing the work, like pounding the pavement, picking up the phone, all that sort of stuff to get stories, but it's not, I don't know, sometimes it, it feels like there's, there's just not enough resources put against that, especially these days. Um, I think the, the, the other part of it is like, you get the whys, and then you also get the, like, Hey, sometimes things change, like mm -hmm. leaks happen. And then a situation changes or like by the time it leaks out, it's already completely outdated. This is something yeah. as someone who is cursed to follow wrestling as someone <laughs> who enjoys wrestling, like this is you, you talk about literacy about leaks and reporting. Uh, it's really crazy because the thing that a lot of people that I, that I see a lot of people doing in wrestling is when someone gets it wrong because it's, it's, it's a story written on a paper. They can change like the TV shows are live every week. They can make a change at any moment, right? right. Especially if something leaks out and they decide they, you know, for whatever reason they want to, you know, get ahead of that and change it or, or whatever. Um, you will then see people who are posting online about wrestling go like this reporter ain't shit. This reporter got it all wrong. And like, okay. Like, do you, like, do you really not understand that, like, how these operations function, that these things can change really quickly, or this information might have been completely dated by the time? Like, it's not necessarily a case where a reporter is wrong. It's a case where sometimes the, the situation has changed. And yeah. I see that a lot in video games as well, kind of behind the scenes. And But people are all just quick to go like, oh, well, this person obviously doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. I'm like, well... Yeah, and like, you know, as an example, the rumors of like the multipod stuff with Xbox, they started with like someone saying Starfield is coming to PlayStation, right? Like, which obviously didn't happen. And I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon if it ever does. But I can totally see a, a point where that was sure. like the word from on high, like we are putting this on PlayStation. Yeah, um, I'm sure they, I'm sure everything is always on the table when you're thinking yeah. about stuff like that. You at least have to go through the process. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, but again, this isn't to, to crap on like news at, at a lot of sites. No, I no. There are a lot I, of sites that are doing incredible yeah. work. Yes. I, th I think that if, if anything, my problem with it is I wish that those sites had better resources to chase down even more stuff. Yeah. Um, also, it's insane that people get money for engagement on Twitter. Like, I think that that is like a prime number one driver of this yeah. stuff. There's a lot of, yeah. I, I, I don't really, I, I have been pretty good about not looking at Twitter anymore. Okay. I, I like I like blue sky. You like blue sky. I love blue sky. It's a very small bubble. Oh yeah. And I got I can't I need more than that. Like I need to have my perceptions challenged at least a little bit. Not by like total I don't need nudes and bio in, under every tweet, but like I need something to challenge my particulars and I don't find that a lot of blue sky. Um Yeah. You're definitely right about that. Uh but I I've kind of I've reinstalled an RSS reader and started just reading a lot more websites and and kind of getting getting more stuff that way instead and it's not perfect i'm not gonna lie to you there are definitely times especially because every time i do look at twitter there's still like a handful of people who have disappeared from my life yeah. because that's the only place i ever saw them and i'm like why is why are you still like i want to go to them and be like you know that you don't have to do this here right like yeah but the guy running this is a fucking monster uh but, but yeah uh, i like to think i cost him a little bit of money every time i tweet sure <laughs> um rogue prince of persia came out yesterday 
Yeah, delayed after Hades 2 shadow dropped and really screwed up its plans. Yeah. I I like the the I like that their message just owned up to it and said, "Hey, we're going to get out of the way of Hades 2 and yeah. uh cuz you know, we're going to we're going to play it instead or whatever." But I guess they 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 said that they spent more time on the build. Um but it did finally come out yesterday. I have this was my first time getting my hands on it. I hadn't seen it uh prior to this other well, I've seen some trailers and stuff. Um and it's coming from Evil Empire, the studio that was brought on to manage Dead Cells updates back in like 2019 or something like that. They've been they've been running Dead Cells for the last like five years. Um but it doesn't it doesn't just feel like Dead Cells with a Prince of Persia kind of mechanic to it. Like you see little bits and pieces I mean, it's a side-scrolling roguelike. It's, you know, like sure. you, you see those those kind of through lines. Um, but they've been very careful to come, come, come up with some interesting combat stuff. Like they've got a button in there where basically if you're standing in front of an enemy, you will just jump up and spin around so you can slice them from the back. Which in a 2D side-scrolling game is like, oh, it's weird to have on a dedicated button. It just feels like such a... It's, it, it feels like a relatively minor inclusion, but it's straight up a face button. It's not even some hold these two buttons down to do it. It's they, they, it feels like they really want you to be doing it all the time. And I'm not sure how I feel about it because you have all these other things at your disposal. Like you can kick a guy and kick him into a wall, but if he's got a shield, the kick won't work. But if you kick an unshielded guy into the shielded guy, it'll knock the shield off of him. Uh, like they, they, it's, it's sounds mechanic. complicated. There is, there is a little bit. Yeah. Cause then there's like, okay, well you can also do a diving attack if you're coming down from above and that will also bust a guy's shield off. Um, they, they've got a lot of weird little mechanics around, around that, around shielded enemies. They've got spikes on the walls. So sometimes you're kicking guys into the spikes and killing them, which is a great time. Um, and it feels very neat and maybe a little content light. Uh, it's an early access, I guess sure. I should say. Like they, it's a very non Ubisoft kind of thing where they have just released it on Steam, and it rings up as like z version zero point one. Oh wow! <laughs> when you load it up, uh, and there's not a like you know re reading through the Steam reviews, it seems like one of the more common complaints is just like, hey, there's about two hours of stuff here, um, which is maybe not a strong place to launch your early access game that still happens to be part of like a relatively major franchise in gaming. Like it's kind of a weird, it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, but I, you know, Ubisoft, I think has sort of gone on the record as saying that they want to sort of do more small experiments like this. Yeah. And I, yeah. you know, I think the best way for a big company to do those experiments is to like let like good indie developers tackle their IP, which is, yeah. you know, talking about like Activision stuff. This is something that I'd like to see Xbox sort of encourage is for like, mm -hmm indie studios to look at activision's ip and say like we think we can do this yeah um so i'm i'm really glad that they did this um, it's neat it, it it that's that's probably the like it feels like it has good bones like I, I think there's you know it might be a little early if people were looking for like a buying recommendation like i said yeah. I, I think there's maybe not a ton of content here yet um but in terms of like the functionality you have and, and you're changing out weapons which kind of modifies your special attack um you have a limited ranged attack that you can like basically swap out a bow for like a, a shock room that you're throwing out and hitting multiple enemies with. And, um, what do you feel about the look of it? I don't love it. That's kind of my, uh, that that's, that's maybe my problem with it overall is it just feels a little, it feels like it's lacking impact. I don't know. It feels a little light, it feels a little, uh, cartoonish for my tastes. Yeah. Silhouettes wise, it almost reminds me of a flash game. Yeah, kind of, like, or like a like a French tin, like a tin tin flash game, <laughs> yes, or something. Yeah, uh, like you went to the French cartoon festival and they showed you this, and you're like, that there was an amazing sure. sword yeah. animation, and, and this was really cool. But like, yeah, it's kind of a weird, um, which it helps it stand out. I mean, I'll, I'll give it yeah. that. Like, there's not a lot out there that, that really looks like this. Um, but they try to convey a lot of things because you can so you can wall run, and so you can run on the background of the environment, assuming there's uh, a wall there. Okay. Um, and sense. you can kind of do it in any direction. So as you're, you can run straight up and then curve around. And so there's a lot of weird mobility to it that you wouldn't necessarily expect a game like this to have. And I don't know that the game necessarily takes full advantage of that currently, but you, 
as you start to mess with it and you're like, okay, I could wall run up, then do a, like a, an air dash and then hit a wall, run up that wall a little bit and then flip off. Like there, there's a lot of capability there that if they were to really lean into it in terms of just like, Hey, we made some platformy challenge rooms. And I found one that, that kind of resembles that and immediately died in it because it was too crazy. Um, there's some stuff there that, that I think could really help it stand out from the zillion other kind of action rogue lights that we're, we're seeing these days. It, it's there's neat stuff here for sure. Is there a progression? Like that was one of the big things about dead cells that like it had like this persistence, right? You are, so when you die, you do go back to some kind of camp that has an anvil at it, uh, even if the anvil is not active currently. But yeah, I, I believe you are getting, um, so you, in game, you'll get gold and you'll find shops and you'll buy kind of run specific upgrades. Um, I haven't seen anything in terms of like, here's a skill tree. Here's a, you know, like, here's where are your, your real progressions go. But it does feel like that in that base camp, there is some sort of, um, some sort of more meaningful uh, upgrade system to to be seen, um, and so I, you know, I imagine that that's one of the things that they'll kind of keep fleshing out as as they go. Um, yeah, it, it's I'm, I'm back and forth on it. Like there there are aspects of the game that just like feel a little flimsy right now, but again, it, you know, for something that is launching in early access, like it it feels like it has good bones. It feels like it has some some interesting ideas. Um, and I'm, I'm very, I, I will definitely keep checking back to see where they go with it. If there's any concern that it won't be French enough because it's Evil Empire working on it, it did launch on a national holiday in the U.S. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So like we, we want to get out of the way of Hades too. So instead we're going to launch it on the day when people go outside. Yeah. The day where uh, no one is paying attention to the internet. Um, right. Or video games. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I didn't realize it until just now, but I guess it's a double, it's a, it's a big week for Ubisoft. Which I feel like when was the last? But X, X Defiant is. Uh, oh yeah, well that was yes. last week, but yeah, that was last week. But it's still kind of, um, it's still kind of happening, I suppose. I've been spending some more time with that. Have you? I played it like yeah back in some of the betas. It mm -hmm. it's feels. I'm not the first person to say this. I'm not taking credit for this. It feels like an Xbox 360 Call of Duty game. Yeah, and I'm not totally opposed to that as someone who doesn't really like modern Call of Duty. It's definitely like there, there's been an interesting range of like seeing as, as you know, seeing the reviews start to to come in um, and people being a little bit more positive on it than I am. Like I, I kind of I see where they're coming from. Like there sometimes I'll read reviews and be like, these people are out of their fucking. But it's like I look at it and go like, yep, totally like this will there. There is definitely something here, especially the idea of it being free to play. Um you know, that at least up until Call of Duty hits Game Pass and maybe that changes some of the math a little bit uh, on the value of X Defiant. But I, I still, as I'm playing X Defiant, my, my main feelings on it are like, yeah, they spent a lot of time building this thing out and there's definitely a game here, but I don't, I, it's hard for me to see a world where it maintains a player base long enough to matter in the you know yeah. next year or you know like like is it gonna go two years or something like it'll probably be better than hyperscape went but i but will it be rainbow six siege absolutely not right not even not not, not even close this is made by some ex call of duty people right yeah yeah like, like mark rubin uh, is is he on was this a Treyarch guy was right Treyarch guy, yeah and um, then the other Treyarch guys made that studio that sony backed that shut down yes that... and then and then then he is now at a new Sony backed studio. Sounds yeah, like that's um, weird. I'd like to hear some, read some reporting on that. Um, yeah, I, so they were Treyarch. This is Treyarch call of duty people, right? Yeah. And, and playing it. And, and you, when I think about that Treyarch era of, Hey, we kind of want to make call of duty into a hero shooter. Like this feels like that it was made by people who really believed in that. And for me, that was the dark days. Those were the dark days of call of duty where I'm like, Oh, you're trying to turn this into something. It is not. Which one was which? Where which? Black Call Ops Duty? Four. Um, well, Black yeah, Ops they were Three and lot. Four, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Black Ops Three. That campaign was so bad. Oh, it was <laughs> starring Elliot Stabler. Yeah. Um, but when you got to the end and you realized, oh my God, you were dying the whole time, uh, or like whatever. Yeah, you got the... RoboCopped real early in that movie. Yeah. Uh, in that, that game. Yeah. That the whole campaign was in your head or whatever. Oh, I, I at least God. appreciate how fucking dumb that was. 
They um, aim for the fences and hit themselves in the face. And you I want to say that was the last like Call of Duty uh, review event I got invited to. Was, I think they did that one in San Francisco, and we had people out of the office, so I had to kind of keep coming and going to cover for for people. And I don't know if they took that as a as a slight, slight. or if they or if they just didn't like that I uh, got really mad that it took more than one melee attack to kill somebody. Now, and I was like, "This is what are you no. people doing?" Excuse me. Um, and or or whatever, but that was that was I believe. I think the last three time. is also the last one that I went to. Yeah. yeah. Um. It had those cool top-down shooter hidden levels, right? Campaign. Yes, yeah, they did. They did do that thing. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, <laughs> but I, but I feel like that era of of like, hey, we want to have these characters have ults, uh, and you can only pick one of them per squad or two of them or whatever the limit was. Like trying to mildly right. push it in this Overwatch like direction, like. But- I, it was post to MOBA pre Overwatch, right? Because Overwatch was like 2016. Yeah. Yes. And so yeah. everyone was like, well, people like MOBAs. We should MOBA our Call yeah. of Duty. Right. Um, and that was. And then choice. we can sell individual skins for these people. And, oh my God. And, yeah. It'll do good uh, now. Yeah, right. Uh, but I, I, to me, that is like where that, where that franchise kind of really started going off the rails. Um, and so the idea that like, well, I mean, just in, like qualitatively, I'm not, you know, sales wise, like whatever. Sure. It is. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that my like my Treyarch honeymoon ended when Oliver North showed up in the game. But sure, I, I, everything you're saying makes total sense to me. <laughs> the, the thing I'll say about Oliver North is fuck that guy. Anyway, that um, is cogent political analysis. <laughs> and yeah, I can get behind it. Uh, there's an audacity to it, at least. But uh, yeah, uh, is that you know here? What? Does it feel like that that Treyarch is it all here? Like what does it feel like there's a Treyarch influence in this game to you as someone who's like probably more on top of Call of Duty historically than anyone I know? Um so I, I think that they're, you know, they have basically an evolved version of the whole like pick a character with a separate ability. Like the factions concept in X Defiant is very much like now you have a, a separate ability and you can pick one of two and you have an ult when your meter charges up. Like it, they are trying to like in, in lieu of doing like Call of Duty kill streaks, they have instead tried to do this character based thing where like oh when your meter fills up you can and they even literally in the the flavor text say like you can have Sam Fisher's pistol like what did he drop it like what you know it, like there are a lot of these guns around like why it's why like a one be? shot pistol it's right? like a golden gun type thing yeah. I believe is, is is sort of the the situation but um yeah I don't know like a lot of those ability abilities have just not been grabbing me um i think there's aspects of the like just the time it takes to kill somebody with shots to the body it feels like they over prioritized um headshots a little bit um so it's very old school call of duty that way yeah so there's like which is a skill thing right i mean you know like it feels like that is the game like this game feels like they sat down and said boy like when they started making it because the situation i think has really changed but it feels like a game that when they sat down to say, let's make a game that is uh, everything that Call of Duty players are disgruntled about, that it feels like that they made a game and set a lot of that stuff in stone way back when. That's and then a Call of Duty. moving target. Exactly. And so Modern Warfare 3, I think, addresses a handful of the, uh, the mobility stuff that people were mad about that X Defiant was trying to capitalize on and be like, oh, we've got all that canceling, all this other stuff. Like, we, we've got that. And now Call of Duty has it again. So... It's sort of, but will it have it next year? Who knows? Uh, it seems weird. to be doing pretty well, like yeah. better than I would have expected. Yeah, it um, sounds like the numbers are are are, are pretty solid for it. Um, but yeah, it, it feels like a. I think was saying like eight million unique players so far. I think that's what the yeah the number was something around that that I I think I saw. Um, there's definitely a game there. I just I. The shooting and some of those aspects of the game just don't feel as good as I want it to feel for me to kind of stick with it. Um, and so this kind of dragged me back into Call of Duty, which is something I haven't, like the last season of Call of Duty. I think I I played long enough to buy Cheech and Chong. And then... Yes, I, I heard uh, the stories. Yes. Uh, and and then, uh, then that was enough for me. And now they are on the verge of launching another new season, apparently with Gundams. Um... 
Yeah, I think I saw like the discourse as to whether or not that would be in the next, if that'd be usable in the next one. So that's that's the thing I feel like, you know, so they got out there today and said that, you know, the game will be on Game Pass, but I think the thing that they need to probably convey sooner rather than later is will your skins come into next year's game? Because why would you buy any season four skin for a Call of Duty game two months before the next one comes out? Uh, it'll probably work in Warzone. I mean, if you, if you think it through, um, it's probably a situation where that stuff will at least continue to work in the battle royale mode, but maybe yeah. Treyarch will want to wipe the slate clean for their Gulf War thing. I wonder if it just depends on like the politics between the studios, because that's something that's been like a thing for forever. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I feel like well, I, I guess I don't know, but but I I always felt like some of that stuff got ironed out just over over the years. Like there, that definitely was a massive massive uh rift between those studios for a while there um but some i think of the most virtual... problematic people were gone yeah i guess yeah i think that's that's some of it um but uh and i think just by virtue of the tech having to like they don't have time they don't have fucking time to fight about shit they've got to make another game next october so they've got to leverage whatever tech the last studio made and they're um, shipping on so many platforms now. yes yeah uh and it makes sense with in, in light of those numbers it seems like it makes sense that they're going to stick to ps4 and xbox one yeah. for it as well so I, I i am glad that that story sort of came out last week that people like finally put that down out and yeah. out there that like actually like a lot of people are still not just like stuck on last gen yeah. but just not interested at all right in like upgrading yeah uh I think it's it's just you know I, it's something you never consider. You always I always think about it as like that one year crossover window where games come out on last gen because you're still migrating people over, but eventually you know you're cutting price on the console and everyone's going to upgrade and uh, it'll, it'll take care of itself and and everyone's going to move forward and it just hasn't happened. This is way. the first generation that hasn't screwed people over for playing a new game on a last gen console when they yeah. get a new one because like. From PS3 to PS4, or Xbox 360 to Xbox One, to a lesser degree. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you bought the last gen version, you were you couldn't play the next generation version, and right. now everything is everything. Although yeah. not on Call of Duty. Now that I think about it, yes. Well, they would sell they would sell a cross gen bundle. So if you bought the mid tier version or higher, you would get both versions. Um, but if you just bought the base version, you were stuck uh, on the ultimate Project Ten Dollar yeah pretty much yeah um i yeah I, I, i've seen some people lamenting like the the loss of like dedicated handhelds because it led to weird offshoot games like this but i think about the games that were lingering on last gen consoles or like backports like weird situations where like here's the playstation one version of tony hawk 3 it has totally different levels it's not a good game but all these years later it's kind of fun to go back and play what is still a mechanically really sound game uh, with wildly different levels than than what you think of as the real game. Yeah, my favorite example of that is definitely Splinter Cell Double Agent. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, Splinter Cell Double Agent on Xbox is basically just Chaos Theory Part 2. Right. Made by Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Shanghai led the next-gen version. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I totally understand why it'll be on the last-gen versions, but it does kind of make me think, well, what are they going to, I don't know, what does campaign look like? In that situation right. yeah yeah or or how do they carve it up i think that that's become the next goal post on this game pass announcement are now people are saying like well they say it's going to be available day one on game pass but how much of it is going to be you know like, what are they gonna they're gonna carve this part out and sell it or they're gonna like i war zone's already free to play how comfortable are you with swearing on this podcast i love it i'm all i don't think it. i don't think they're gonna fuck around with that no, I think I don't that it will just be the game. The question is like, will you be able to pay for an early access version? And I think right. the answer is a hundred percent. Yes. More Definitely. yes this year than ever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just You'll get a I day mean, I, one on game pass, but what about day negative three? What about day buy, 72 hours before that? If you buy some kind of nebulous upgrade, you can pay $30 and play it for free. And I am the asshole. that's like, all right, I'll do that. 
I mean, I, I've, you know, just for coverage purposes, just to make sure, just in case the email doesn't come in or, you know, or, or whatever, like I have yeah. bought pre-ordered the last couple of call of duties for freaking beta access. Um, Listen, before anybody feels judged, I paid a hundred dollars for suicide squad. So I am like out in back chained to a post more than anybody here. Probably yeah. that's, uh, yeah, we've all been there. I feel like there was a, a, a long time there running reviews where the only games I bought were the really bad ones because those were the ones that didn't get sent out. Yeah. We would, it would be like me and Alex walking into a game stop and buying like 20 games in November. And the guy just looking at us going, what do you, why are you buying three versions of the same game? What do you, we're and connoisseurs, like, sir. Yeah. No, I just, I just love video games. <laughs> Usually a different just, bouquet. Just try to leave him as confused as possible and, uh, and, and move on. Um, is X Defiant on Xbox One and PS4? Is that cross cross? That is a good question. It seems like something that should be, but I don't know that it is. Uh, I love being on a, a PC, PlayStation Five, Xbox Series X and S, not on last gen. That is really surprising yeah, to me. Yeah. Huh. That seems like there's an opportunity there. Yeah, that they. Um, I God, I just I'm really surprised that that a multiplayer game isn't shooting for those. I would, yeah, and at that point, you know, you think like, well, there's probably some market for a game like this on Switch as well. If you really, if you really want to thread the needle and, and you know, have a, a fun port, uh, you know. I feel like Switch is one of those things where the, the install base is big enough that like whether or not there's like a market for it, there's mm -hmm. at least like a few million players there that would probably want to play it. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Maybe they'll get to it. Maybe if the game has legs, they'll go like, oh, okay, we'll, uh, we'll go back and, and do it. Maybe there'll be a Switch 2 launch game. Um, yeah. God, who knows what that's going to look like. <sighs> I think yeah. my expectations for it are slightly lower than other people as far as, like, power. I think some of the stuff, like, as, as people were documenting shipping notifications to figure out what the RAM was going to be and, and whatever else, like, it... it the thing that clicked for me was like, oh, wait, is this just, is this the 4K Switch Pro rumor? Is is that actually just what their next console is going to be? Like, huh? No, mm. that was a different console. And I am like, I am 99.9% .9 convinced that the Switch Pro was a thing that got canceled because yeah. of when it came down. Um, but yeah, I, I still think that like the Switch 2 will be not quite as powerful as like a PS4, for example, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, well, maybe they can use upscaling to kind of get where they need to get to yeah. with it or, or whatever. And yeah, it'll um, be fine. It'll be fine. It'll Mario will look better than ever. That yeah. guy. Um, That's all I care about, really. Exactly. So yes, uh, to get into the news here, they they did go ahead and confirm that the game is called Call of Duty Black Ops Six. I kind of admire the audacity of just slapping a number that high on it and not going with the rumored Black Ops Col uh, Gulf War, which I think it was a terrible name. Um, and, uh, this is, this is a really weird, I'm uh, doing this in an election year, running your campaign about, uh, misinformation and how the government lies and, and all of this other stuff. It's a really weird time for them to be doing it. Some would say it's a perfect time for them to be doing this, but I, I'm not a big fan uneasy. of like, nobody can be trusted kinds of narratives i think that yeah. that is like a specific fever swamp that i think is particularly mm -hmm. Except dangerous for right frank now. woods if you can't trust frank woods oh man um so yeah. all we really know here is that yes the the game is kind of set in a gulf war timeline which would fill in a gap i think between some of the futuristic call of duty game uh, black ops games and and some of the stuff they've done in the past obviously uh they did black ops cold war which was more of an eighties thing. So this could really follow on from that in terms of its place in the narrative. They put out a live action trailer full of fake people. Uh, you want your Margaret Thatcher's, you, you, you think Ollie North uh, was a weird one. Now we've got fake Saddam Hussein. We've got fake George Bush. We've got some real George Bush in there. You've, they've got footage of Bill Clinton playing a sax in their marketing campaign. Like that's the, like is Arsenio going to show up? Can I play as Arsenio in zombies mode? Like what are we, what's up? I am frankly horrified by the number of major like events, historical events that they could mine for this. Like any one of which would be terribly offensive. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th yeah. there has been some, and who who knows 
but there have been people out there claiming that 911 will be represented in game in some fashion which i right. think you don't do this game unless you're doing that but it's not just that there's like the oklahoma city bombing sure right yeah. there yeah. was the 96 olympics bombing oh and they could tie all that stuff together and say that uh, it, it was the russian you know, oh man there's a lot of waco really nasty. yeah heaven's waco. gate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um also the the rise of the taliban was during yep. the 90s yeah so yeah that's this is great i'm really excited to see the nuance and sensitivity that they apply to i wonder events. if anything is really you know i i think um ruby ridge yeah 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 um, ruby ridge, God. there's there's been obviously like you know microsoft owns the studio now but it feels like this narrative would have had to have been locked oh yeah quite a bit before that this train left um, the station like 18 months ago yeah and and so i think about everything i know about bobby kodak and his leanings and how that maybe influenced call of duty design on down uh and some of the activision leadership that's maybe no longer there but and go like oh i wonder if this will oh, yeah. result in any sort of changes in future call of duty games but probably not this one see how it does yeah um I... I love black ops and this is probably just because I was alive for all of this shit and, and cognizant of all of this shit. And so it, that's obviously a very different thing. I'm sure there were some people that felt a, a certain type of way about the way black ops did, you know, Vietnam and, and some other things that desert that storm on. had trading cards, right? Yes. I, and you, and they were, and no one was, at least no one that I knew was questioning that. I was just like, no, here's my Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf card. This guy's awesome. He's on I the will. news every night. What a badass. I got two A-10 Warthogs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was a very, it was a very weird time. Um, I remember very clearly not being able to play Mega Man 3, I think, because my dad was watching live coverage of all of this stuff mm. yeah that that sounds about right yeah yeah i would yeah uh so yeah I, I think i think that's probably why i am a little weirded out by this is because this will end up i think that's probably when we think about the call of duty demographics like that this is probably the case for a lot of its player base where this will be the first one that touches on some of that stuff that i now look at at a very through a very different lens than i did when i was in junior high uh have very different thoughts about those days uh looking back on it now for sure um but i can't help but you know it, like this is a, also a franchise that you know they put noriega in it like they've they've done so much yep. shifty fucking weird sure shit with it did. over the years that there is a part of me that can't wait to see what type of bullshit they try to fucking cram into this thing um i want to know but uh but also taking over the front page of USA Today uh, with a, a fake newspaper article that uh, says the truth lies and it says Mount Rushmore defaced and it shows a uh, picture of Mount Rushmore with all of the heads of Mount Rushmore wearing blindfolds that say the truth lies and the logo of that they've been using to promote the game. Um, it says advertisement at the top of it. I know th this is not, the you know, it's not the first time that USA Today has done some weird front page stuff, right? Amazon actually did this with like the Washington Post, the New York Times, and USA, or sorry, LA Times, Chicago Tribune, USA Today for their uh, White House Papers movie a few years back, the one with Adam Driver. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is not uncommon. I feel like it maybe feels a little bit grosser here than it does some of the others. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, again, it's one of those things where the the tenor of political conversation in this country right now combined yeah. with what a black ops game typically is and showing this specific thing uh of mount rushmore blindfold like in, in an era when you know everyone is now getting inundated with ai images and there's a generation or two of people out there who are ill-equipped to know what the fuck is real and what the fuck is not at any given time it almost feels irresponsible do you I know how I feel. Do you feel like this is edgy? Because that's what not, they're going for, right? Yeah, not, not especially. Um, I, I well, I feel like it's maybe over the line. 
in some ways, um, which I guess by narr- by by definition means that it has to have at least a little bit of edge to it. But instead, it, it doesn't feel edgy. It feels like, like I said, like maybe slightly irresponsible, like a case of like you could have read the room a little bit better on where we're at as a country right now. Uh, and we've to, been there for a while. Yes. Yeah. Well before these decisions were made and they made the choice to kind of lean into this um, in a way that I just go like, that's, I think that's kind of dumb. I, you know, like we've seen on the other end, we've seen like the opposite of this where a company had something that felt very politically charged that like had all of the tooth pulled from it with Far Cry yeah. 5. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would love to see them go for it, but I don't know what that means in this context. Um, I'm a little I, horrified at the idea of Treyarch going for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. But like, but like at the same time, I think that again, I think people that looking back on that era now, like I said, I, th- I think a lot of people feel differently about it now than they did then. And so I think there's probably a way to thread that needle. Um, in a way that maybe has something to say about this era. But then when you think about what black ops typically is, all they're really going to say is like, yeah, the government was up to some shit. You're like, yeah, "Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Threading the needle can be a little hard when you're too busy, like pounding protein shakes and shit posting on Reddit. Yes. So yeah, I don't know. Um, Yeah. Um, It will be day one on game pass. And that's basically all they've, all they've said. Like they put out a thing this morning and it it literally the the first sentence is the only new information there is them confirming that it will that it will be on game pass this this also the the reveal of the title led to them unredacting the fact that after the showcase that event will indeed be a call of duty event which they had already tipped their hand on pretty heavily um and i guess we'll wait until the showcase to to see more of the game um yeah, I don't know. Like Modern Warfare 3, I think feels like half a game for a lot of very good reasons. Um and so I do think that a full-fledged full-on Call of Duty game is still of interest to me. Uh, They've been working on this one for a long time too, yeah. right? Yeah. Like was yeah. Cold War the last one that they did? Yes. Yeah, uh, so this is like the longest a, a a Call of Duty has had in development, I think, ever. I be- yeah, you're. Yes, I believe that's right. Um, and I don't, I don't think Cold War was a great game, and so that yeah, that kinda, I fell off it super quick. Yeah, um, I think the way they structured that campaign was like fascinating, but the when they started to pull it together, it felt like it felt like it was coming from a place where they were like, oh right, I guess because it's a Black Ops game we need to lean into this specific type of like mind control narrative or whatever. Otherwise it's not black ops. And so it, it, the, the payoff, um, by the time you get to the end of it, I I think there's a lot of stuff there that just feels very, uh, rote when it comes to the black ops franchise, sub franchise specifically. But would uh, you, do you think predictable? Would you say it was predictable? Uh, I think Less predictable. I mean, you you kind of know that something's going to happen. And so that part is predictable. I think the way they get there is underwhelming. So when they, when they get to the end of it and and kind of like pull the rug and go like, here's what it really is. You're like, oh, okay. That's not nearly as interesting as like the five other things I cooked up in my head. Um, You kind of just chose the, what felt like the shortest way out of this story. Uh, And so it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, It could have done with, with some more, but like good characters, like, you know, in terms of just like eighties dickhead action movie or or like CIA handlers and like the things we think of as like, you know, coming out of films of that era and stuff. I think they did a pretty good job tonally with some characters and some of the scenarios there. It's just, yeah, I don't know. Like it all just kind of comes together and you're like, all right, well, whatever. At least I can buy Bruce Willis. Um, Bungie has come out ahead in court against a cheat software maker. They've done this before, but this is the first time that it actually went to a jury. Uh, And so now we have this weird kind of, I guess, precedent on this. They went after a company called Aim Junkies and its parent company, Phoenix Digital. This is according to videogameschronicle.com. They only got 63 grand because they basically got the revenue 
uh, that the the cheat software earned them, but uh, the the thing they really got here is a is a jury verdict uh, finding the company liable for copyright infringement. So they didn't go after them specifically for like, hey man, cheats are wrong. Uh, it was more, hey, you had to reverse engineer our software to generate this stuff. This goes against our EULA, um, and all of this other stuff. There was a counterclaim filed by the cheat company claiming like, oh, you hacked my computer to discover that I was working on this stuff to which the counter, I guess the Bungie's counter to that was, well, again, the ULA allows us to monitor your machine for whatever else is running on there as part of our anti-cheat. Uh, and, and so the, the jury didn't, did not fall for that one. This doesn't, I'm really torn on this, man. Cause like on one hand, I think that companies that are out there selling cheats for multiplayer games are just straight up scum. <laughs> um, Don't sugarcoat it, Jeff. Yeah. Like they are out there fucking up video games and, and causing software developers to have to generate even more invasive and fucked up forms of anti-cheat uh, for PC games that are also not a great thing for PC security. But this is something they went through the DMCA to get. And so I look at it and just go, man, this is the fallout from this almost looks like, and, and I am no lawyer. I know everyone thinks I am, but I assure you I am not. Um, what would stop Rockstar from trying to use some of this precedent to say, hey, if you're making mods for our games, not even cheats, um, we're going to try to lean on this verdict and try to interpret it a certain way to fuck up a lot of very legitimate uh, modifications for video games out there. Yeah, and I like... I'll preface this with the standard. I am not a lawyer, but I think part of the reason they took this, like, I guess there are, are like one of the main reasons they like a company like this goes to a jury instead of a bench trial, like a jury trial means jurors sit and a bench trial means the judge decides Yeah, um, is like jury trials can go for damages, mm -hmm. um, which I think in that way, I'm sure that this is sort of establishing to people out in the world that like, look, if you fuck with our game, we are coming yes. after your money. Like we're yeah. not just shutting down your website. We're not shutting down your discord. We are taking as much money as a jury will give us, which can be a lot. Yeah. Um, I also, I'm not sure, but maybe like a jury trial makes for better case law for future lawsuits. That is my understanding of it in terms of just like citing it as a, as a precedent yeah. um, is that having, have an actual jury go through this process. I mean, certainly settlements would, you know, not establish that, but now, now we have this in place and yeah, it, it's like I said, I think it's really great to shut down a lot of this anti-cheat stuff for multiplayer games. Um, it's, uh, it's no good, but if this ends up getting used in there, it, it feels like there are other ways this, this case could be used to really, uh, screw with a lot of, again, very legitimate modifications to games. Right. And I think that you would. I think it's safe to assume that it will be used for those things. Like it's I'm sure will. there are plenty of lawyers looking at this right now and going like, who, can we go after any sort of, you know, th there's a story going around that Warner brothers is trying to shut down a mortal Kombat one modder who has modded a lot of yeah. pop culture characters into the current mortal Kombat. Uh, there's been videos of like Drake and Kendrick Lamar fighting in mortal Kombat, And I don't know if this guy made those models or th those skins or whatever specifically, but um, it's a weird case where like, Ed Boone has shared some of those videos on Twitter and been like, look at this, this is crazy. And then suddenly Warner is like, Hey, we're coming for you. Yeah. Uh, but Ed Boone's job isn't to like make sure totally. that, that their copyrights are protected. Yes. Like this like throws me back to that whole elder scrolls sues Mo Yang for scrolls thing, right. which yes. is like they have a obligation to protect their trademarks. And I think in situations like this, especially when, there are a lot of litigious companies like say Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it behooves the company to say, look, we're not okay with this. We're not cool with people throwing this copyrighted information that you just signed a billion dollar deal to put all these characters in another game. Like we're not, we're not trying to step on that. Please don't sue us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're right. I'm sure that that probably weighs on them at least a little bit when, when making these sorts of decisions. Um, there's been some unverified. It's, it's the time of year for unverified rumors. Um, Favorite of unverified rumors. Yes. Uh, Video Games Chronicle is reporting that according to Bill Bill Coon, there is a new Astrobot game coming for the PlayStation 5. Not a lot of other details there other than 
that the title could be simply called Astrobot and that it could be announced within the next 15 days, which, yeah, I mean, if Sony's going to do anything, it'll probably be in the first half of June uh, in terms of having an event. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I would like to see a new Astrobot game because that pack in with the PS5 was so good, but also I don't think you can do that again. And going out and making an even bigger Astrobot game sounds cool, but. The thing that made that Astrobot pack in so special didn't necessarily have to do with it being like an amazing platformer or whatever. It was a just a great love letter to the PlayStation brand. Yeah, and it would be hard to do that twice. Yeah. And um, also it was a dual sense demonstration. Yes. Yeah. So it was like a, a pack in that showed you what the controller was capable of, which two games since then have used it to that effect, like Returnal and Maybe just Returnal, uh, and um, the Spider-Man games I think did a pretty oh, good you, job. Oh, you know what? Especially... You're right. Yeah, the Spider-Man games do do have some stuff like that. Uh, I think like the, the Returnal example is just because there's like rain in a spot, so it's very noticeable. So they do this uh, in but... Spider-Man too. I feel yeah. like where you can feel like the rain sort of like tapping across the controller, which is like yeah. not useful to me, but is neat. It's really neat. Yeah, I whatever sony has like cut back a lot on their spending for weird stuff that is not blow your dick off quadruple a projects so yes psvr2 but... somehow made it out the door though yeah and they shipped it with like a big expensive yeah. horizon game mm -hmm. um and now that yeah. studio is not working on vr games anymore right um <laughs> yes um it is a little weird that the psvr shipped without something like this yeah, I would I would have thought that if there was going to be another Astrobot thing, it would be like now let's do this for VR, um, and show off the the features of that like some kind of of good pack in that's like here's what eye tracking really means for you would have been would have actually been kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, unverified rumor that, number. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I you know this is an unverified rumor, but I don't think that VGC would be publishing the story if they hadn't seen smoke on their own. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I, I I tend to agree with you there. Um, and I yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Asobi hasn't. I don't think they've shipped anything since the PS5 pack-in stuff. So uh, they're due. Uh, another leak. This one coming out of a uh, Eurogamer, according to a retailer, that 2K has forged a partnership with FIFA. Uh, and that they will, they are set to ship a soccer game this calendar year using the FIFA brand. I could see it. There was a while there that it seemed like FIFA was going to go off and try to make their own game, whatever that meant. Like at the time of the split with EA, the talk was like, oh, well, we're going to make FIFA games. I'm like, no, you're not. I mean, you're corrupt, but you're not corrupt enough to make a video game. Um, You're corrupt enough to try to trick somebody else into doing it and screw them on the contract. <laughs> exactly. So here comes 2K. Uh, what do you th what do you think on this? I you know do you think that like EA has successfully migrated its user base to understand that hey the our game is no longer called FIFA or do you think that people will see a box in stores or on a digital storefront that reads FIFA on it and they'll go oh I get that one. Um, well, they definitely, I mean, just the sales and revenue numbers from yeah. EA Sports FC suggest that they have like converted those annual purchasers over. But I also think, you know, if like 2K is looking for markets to expand into like opportunities, I, this, this seems like a pretty decent opportunity. Like they've taken it to EA in the sports business before and beaten them. Yeah. Like we haven't seen an EA basketball game in a real long time. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, uh huh. Um, and you know, I, I guess my only thing is that it seems really fast to do like a whole new sport with like, right. They don't making stadiums takes a really long time. And s like soccer foot fans are very particular about that shit. Um, yeah. Um, Eurogamer claims that they, uh, that, that the rumor has been going around for a while and that there's been claims from earlier this year, uh, and that the, basically they are getting ready to announce it. And, but yes, the, 
The specifics of the rumor are FIFA 2K25 is set to launch this year just in time for FIFA World Cup 2K26, which, yeah, unless they signed this a long time ago, well, even if they signed it the day after EA walked, like, that's still yeah. a long, you know, that's not a, a huge ramp up to get all of that stadium, all the assets and everything yeah. they need generated, unless, well, I was going to say maybe they could do, like, a arcade style thing or... Oh, no. something like that, this, but the, that wouldn't, they couldn't write the FIFA name on that without. I, I think that I wonder if what's going to come out is that like a lot of these stadiums and stuff are partially AI generated and have really weird mistakes in them. Yeah. Um, um, or if they, well, so if they do it as a, cause, cause EA would do their like road to the world cup games, like every handful of years. And since that's like a smaller tournament, and maybe I'm wrong about this because what the fuck do I know about soccer? But I, my understanding is that has fewer teams in it. And so if you're doing, if you're not having to represent every single aspect of FIFA, then maybe you could get away with like, Hey, we've got a smaller list of stadiums to create teams, player faces, whatever else. God, how do you compete with that product? Yeah. Like there is, there is enough space in the fandom for two soccer games. Like Konami demonstrated that until Definitely. they ruined their soccer game, trying to yeah. turn it into a live service. Yeah. But like that's because I think that the players were largely like on par from game to game. Yeah. Um, I can be wrong about that. There so. eventually there were exclusive licenses around like specific clubs. Yeah, yeah. Or or the specific sub leagues or whatever. Like EA had FIFA, but there was always the Premier League and or right. whatever other whatever other stuff is out there. I don't know. But now um, FC has that stuff, doesn't it? I Yes, I, because it's because they don't have FIFA. I think they went out yeah. and, and tried to do all of those deals instead. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That would be that seems like it would be a very heavy lift for Two K to take on, unless they were figuring out some way to do that Road to the World Cup style presentation that EA would do, where there's just less stuff that they have to create. Let me let me just pitch something to you, and I know it sounds crazy, but hear okay. me out. All right, what if? They released their soccer game for twenty dollars. I love it. I love it. What a great idea! Unless then FIFA took that to mean that hey, our brand is not being presented in a premium fashion, and now we're revoking this contract and signing an exclusive deal with someone else. But there's nobody else, is the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. You're right. I and part of me is like I. I wonder how happy FIFA is with this because I don't think that their bargaining position was as strong as they thought that it would be. Right. I'm sure everyone said if he was like EA Sports FC, who the fuck is going to buy that? Who the fuck are buying all these copies of EA Sports FC? Right. Um, Konami has their is is there is e soccer e, e football e still going? Probably. I see it on Google Play. Yeah. Uh, um, and I it, it came to consoles and and PC I think too, but I, I don't know that. E football 2024. PS4 yeah, and PS5 seemed, games seemed like no one was especially happy with that. Um, yeah, when it launched, but but yeah, uh, but it, I don't know. It, it, I guess it would it would make sense. Uh, 2K seems to be wanting to go for it in as many different ways as possible. If this license becomes available, I could. There must why, be why, like why wouldn't it? some kind of thing to mitigate risk on this first one? Because like, yeah. why do you go into business with like? And this is saying something, maybe the world's most corrupt sports agency other than the official Olympic Commission. Right. Um, well, you know, I just because it's corrupt doesn't mean it's going anywhere or that, or that people don't like it. True. So I, you I know, guess we'll see. There's still money to be made on it, I suppose. I mean, people make UFC games and look at those guys. Do they like the UFC? Do they sell? Do the UFC games sell? Oh, I don't know. I, I know. I just know people. There are people who like the UFC. I don't know. But do those games yes. sell? I, I actually don't don't know. Uh, I, 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 I encounter those approach people. every single one of those that EA puts out and like each one slightly less as they go because it just feels like it's never felt like it needed to be an annual franchise and, and they are right to not do it as an annual franchise. But I think even with their every two or three years thing. I guess I'm just not an, enough of a UFC fan to actually care uh, is, is the, the thing I like old UFC when it was bad and dangerous. I, I was watching some uh, videos the, uh, not too long ago of people doing judo in a car 
I think I saw Karjitsu, I believe they call it. Yep, that sounds right. And uh, I think you're muted. I think you may have. Um. Okay. Um. Hello? Hello. Or I can, I can, okay. Everyone can hear you except for me, which is even weirder. Okay, never mind. I have figured out the problem. I need to. Did Windows change your audio a, device? Yeah, okay. Now, now it's fine. I bought a keyboard that has buttons on the side of it. That's and one of the buttons. Up. And one of the buttons is like disable the Windows key. And one of them is mute all audio. And uh, sometimes things bump it. And that's not very good. Um, we can put them, we'll put them next to each other. Who, who, who could make a mistake? It'll be fine. It's not like I have a controller over here that is constantly bumping up against the left side of the, the keyboard as I uh, so shift around. But uh, Karjitsu, you were Karjitsu. saying. Karjitsu. So it's two guys. They get into, they flip a coin to see who gets uh, the, the driver's side or, or to see who picks driver's side or passenger side. And then they both get into the car and they both look really intense. And then the whistle blows and they try to fucking beat the shit out of each other inside of a car. Like they're seat belted in. So the first thing they have to do is get the seatbelt off and then get on the other guy and try to choke him out or, or whatever. If they fall out of the car's windows, the, the, the fight stops, they get back in the car, they reset and they go again. And it's like a three round oh. fight inside of a fucking car. Some Russian dude came up with it. So it's there's like, no car out. Like the fight continues. No, exactly. Yeah, the, the 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 car it will temporarily stop the battle if you fall all the way out of the car. But I saw a fight where one guy was basically all the way out of the car trying to choke another guy. A seat broke and and fell all the way back, and they're fighting in the back seat. All of a sudden, they're trying to choke each other with the fucking seat belts. It is the if you want a lawless frontier for fighting that feels scary the way that some of those first UFC events did. Uh, this is not quite that, but it scratched a similar itch. So those like, first UFCs were horrifying. Yes. Uh, and I missed that. <laughs> as, as much as Who I, needs a backyard? You know? Yeah, Who exactly. needs a backyard? Yeah, we just throw an octagon back there. We're good. Um, but yes, car, car jitsu is the, is the way and the light as far as I mean. If, if we're looking for... It's the slam ball. As NBA is to slam ball car jitsu is to ufc this is like a drill tweet <laughs> we're getting there um it, it was something that i just I, I couldn't even believe it existed and the guy who was doing the announcing for the event i saw was also like a religious man and so he would like much like the coney island uh, uh hot dog eating contest where at some point the guy on the microphone just verges off into scripture uh this like was on the verge of doing that a couple of times and i'm just like what like where he's like at the end of it, he's giving inspirational messages to the youth. And I'm like, you guys are fighting in a car inside of a weird garage. Like what, what are you going to tell the youth about what we're doing here? Look, the Russian um, economy is in a weird place, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so this was the American offshoot of it. They have, uh, oh, I saw boy. one where the, the guy, the invent, they brought the inventor over to uh, America and had him, him fight a guy. And he, Eat this. She fucking worked. It was fascinating. It was the on world. Turf. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's the sort of thing that you just look at and go like, I'm glad this exists, but this doesn't say good things about society. Yeah, Ivan Drago'd that guy. Yeah. Um, speaking of good things about society, Atari has acquired the rights to the Intellivision name. Our long national nightmare is over. It's not. It's not. Um, but. Uh, so let's see here. They have acquired some very specific aspects of this. You may remember uh, the Intellivision name was most recently being used to try to launch a new console called the Intellivision Amico, which was designed to be a family-friendly device. They took a lot of rounds of funding on public funding sites like Republic. And um, it has not maybe gone well for them. Anyway, they sold off the right coin. Uh, I know. Well, th that was there was if, depending on which Tommy Tallarico comments you read and what week you got them, that was something that they were. Oh, you were definitely oh doing God, this, and I then forgot. it was like, um, the the statements coming out of uh out of the people who were behind the Intellivision Amico have been fascinating for a very long time. It has been the most slow motion car crash. 
type of thing that's been happening in gaming, I think for the last five years now or something. Um, anyway, one part of this chapter is over because they have dealt the rights to the Intellivision name uh, to Atari, much like Moby Games. Uh, now Atari owns the Intellivision name and a lot of rights to games. Uh, some reports have been saying around 200 games. And as a part of this, the Intellivision Amico will rebrand. They will stop using the Intellivision name. Atari will license the rights to whatever games that they were already in development on, Shark Shark or whatever, um, back to them for release on the Amico console, which is coming any day now, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and the Amico, the company will have to rebrand as, as something else, whether they call it Amico LLC or, or, or whatever. They have basically sold off the rights to all of the legacy IP that they acquired, uh, back in the day. Um, there's a quote from Mike Micah, who's the head of a digital eclipse here says uniting Atari and Intellivision after 45 years ends the longest running console war in history. Which is funny, but is. they don't own they don't own the ColecoVision name. So as far as I'm concerned, it's still on. Um, the embers still burn. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is this has been such a weird story. I don't know if you've like this has been something I can't help but follow. Uh, like I can't help but keep current on. Um, this has been there have been situations here where. People responsible for the Amico have called people detracting from their efforts gaming racists, which is a good uh, one. Um, oh they have spent a lot of time talking about the haters. There's a, 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 a cadre of people on YouTube that have made been making videos because at some point they, they stopped getting behind the Amico console and they said, well, we're going to ship an app. And so they shipped an app where you can digitally purchase some of the Amico games. It's called Amico Home. And so it runs on your phone, but you can't just play it on one phone because the other phones are your controllers. And so the idea is you will install it on your phone and then use a separate phone as a controller to play these games. Like, which the Amico looks like it's basically just like a low, like spec wise, it's like kind of a low end Android box that would use, uh, touchscreen devices as controllers. And so the idea of using a phone as a controller makes sense for what they're making. But in lieu of shipping consoles, they decided like, maybe we can get some revenue coming in this way. But then they created the most cockamamie scheme of how you might get this stuff to work that I have maybe ever seen in my life. Yeah. I mean, look, I, <laughs> I've been, you know, I'm not just a, a colleague of sorts. I'm also a subscriber. So I've mm -hmm. been, I've been watching your saga with the Amico for years. You were the cheesecloth through which my Amico news <laughs> is strained. Okay. Uh, but every time you say anything about it, I forget instantly because my body is protecting me. That's smart. I wish I wish I had that. I right. wish I had that level of protection, but mine's been worn away by out of too much taurine over the years or something. I think just, right. you know, it's the sacrifices we make to work in this industry. People don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to really, muck around in the shit. It, it doesn't just destroy relationships. It destroys your brain. It does. Yes. Um, I, it's like, it's weird because we've both witnessed some pretty colossal boondoggles. I don't get a chance to say that very often, but we've seen yeah. some pretty amazing boondoggles in the video game space. Like, and this actually is impressive even next to the, like the Ouya shipped. Right. Yeah. On they, that time thing, even. That thing came out. It was terrible, but it came out. It had two good games, you know, um, right. I, I don't know. I guess this is good, right? Because now you can like in television without it being having like this tumor who used to make video game music attached to it. Right. Um, uh, I, I think it's it's to me it's interesting because I think that uh, Digital Eclipse has largely been doing really good work with classics when it comes to some of the Atari compilations they've been doing. I get a little bit closer to saying it unqualified as they push in this direction. Atari has been making some really interesting moves with this stuff. They bought digital eclipse, um, which hopefully won't go bad someday, but, uh, but like for a while there, they were making weird purchases. Like they, they bought Moby games, which 
weird. Uh, they bought like Atari age and some other, like they had some web properties. And then simultaneously they were like talking about doing hotels and they minted some kind of crypto thing. And you're like, okay, well fuck these guys. Like they're, it's a disaster. Like that's some of that stuff still exists, but they have pushed it out of the sphere of like their main offering to the point where like, okay, there is some part of Atari that is still working on this trash, but we're over here focused on games and trying to make this thing like not a laughing stock anymore. It feels like they're consciously trying to establish credibility. Yes. With and like there, it's a, they're a doing lot some of it decisions. through, yeah, through like merchandise. Like they're like, Hey, some people want cool track suits with the Atari logo on it. Let's offer that. And, and they're already selling an Intellivision t-shirt. Um, so you have know, you ordered yours yet? No, I, I, I don't have a love for the Intellivision. I never did. Like it just, the controller was always, uh, like gross to me. So, <laughs> uh, so I just never, I had, my cousin had one and I remember playing like poker on it and being like, this sucks. Everything about this sucks. Um, and so I just never really, never really care all, all that much for, for those games, but you know, they've been re-released over the years. There was like an Intellivision collection for the PlayStation one and, and being able to kind of revisit those games there. So I assume that at some point we get some kind of compilation like that out of digital eclipse. I would love to see them tell the story of Intellivision. Um, the same way they told the story of Atari. I think some of their, their documentary things that they've been putting together have been fascinating. If the material is there. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think this was a six, seven or eight figure deal? Um, right not an eight not an eight not an eight and closer I, to six than to eight if closer to sevens. six definitely closer to six than eight if you told me it was a very low seven i'd be like okay like two three million yeah something something like, and like that. a pizza and a like a pack exactly of beer, a case of beer. like yeah um in other words i i don't think it's enough money to really I mean, they need all the money they can get, but I, I like the, the idea here is, is, and so there's, there's a quote here from Phil Adam, who's the CEO of Intellivision or the company no longer known as Intellivision, I suppose. Atari has been a valuable partner and we have co every confidence they will be a responsible steward of the storied Intellivision brand. We look forward to our expanded collaboration and bringing a broad array of new Atari and Intellivision titles to the Amico and Amico home family gaming platforms. I guess I'm just not sure what value this brings to Atari other than to say they have it. It's IP. I'm not saying there isn't. Yeah. yeah. But I, you, I, what, how valuable is the IP though? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's IP that they can merchandise off of through. I, I, I think Atari is still so small right now that that probably still matters to them. Like I okay. said, they had a t-shirt on day one. So that's, I, I look at that and say their priorities are on making small money off this stuff as soon as they can. And then eventually, you know, through their ownership of digital eclipse, like presumably putting out some kind of compilation or, or whatever with this. So I, I imagine that the price has to be right on this. Gently um, leveraging fading nostalgia. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And they also just brought back the infogram name, like not that long ago. And they're like, we're going to publish our new stuff there. I'm like, I appreciate you pronouncing it correctly, by the thank way. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I heard the song. I know how it goes. Uh, do you remember the last Infogram game you played? Is it Alone in the Dark for the Dreamcast? I don't. I, I, that's the one that, that's always the good. No, because I guess they were making things up until like Test Drive Unlimited was them, right? I think so. My I remember very clearly my last Infogram game, which was Slave Zero, also on Dreamcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just just brought just brought back just brought back. Zero. There is a Slave Zero something or other, yes. Yeah, like I don't that know why. game. But, yeah. yeah. Every press release I get about that, I go like, why? what? I, okay. Cool, I bought I that game with my money, and I don't know why they'd make another one, but, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Someone like, in chat says it's pretty cool. Good. Okay. Well, all right. Interesting. I'll, I will, perhaps I will give yeah. it a look. Um, but I, I, I think that, like, they probably make their money back um, on this purchase through a mix of like whatever merchandise they end up doing because that for it through the Atari stuff, they've been doing weird things. It's not just, um, t-shirts and fucking speaker hats. Like they, they're selling like original or, or reproduction arcade boards that don't have the chips in them, but it's like, here's a defender board or, or not defender. Cause that's not them. But, um, but they've been like selling 
reproductions of of some of Atari's arcade games uh, that you could theoretically use to repair an arcade cabinet if you threw the chips in them and did a lot of work. But it's more like hang this on your wall, and so it's this weird, like almost collectibles business that they're trying to get into. Um, that I think they could do all of that with the Intellivision stuff, and and they've been making you know original like reproductions of the original consoles. That I bet they do that with the Intellivision eventually. And that here's a USB version of the original Intellivision controller, and they sell some of those. And I think just bit by bit between a big compilation for modern consoles and this like reproduction nostalgia stuff, I think they probably get to whatever they need out of it, whether it's two X, three X of the holding out. Or... Are you holding out for a game room revival, Jeff? That's always, like always. It's, it, you know, you want to talk about a feel good moment. What could Microsoft do to turn things around? Game room, bringing back game room. Now they own a, another chunk of those games because they've, they own pitfall. They own all the Activision oh, yeah. stuff that already shipped on game room. Like it's all, I, I'll, I'll find my windows phone. Oh, fuck. I have, I will, and I have a windows phone within arm's reach of me literally right the second. I, I think I might also in this drawer down here, you know, in case you need to play some crackdown project sunburst, you know, some of the quality, the best crackdown game. Did you know the game pass app, at least on iPhone has like a version of hexic built into it? Yeah. Yeah. Like a weird hidden, like that's, that's a neat little touch. Yeah. That's what they, matter, need. They, 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 they could use some more. Everyone could use some more neat little touches. I think in, in the console space, like if, if they do with this handheld Xbox, it should, they should roll out a blades interface at the same time. Optional, but like give the people what they want. Agreed. Give them the blades. And, game um, room. and give, yeah, give them the blades, give them game room. I remember interviewing the guy who was in charge of game room when they first rolled it out. And like, I, I get the impression that I was the only person psyched about it conceptually. I thought it was because, neat. Yeah. Um, but like interviewing him and, 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 and hearing stories from people who were at the developer that were doing a lot of that work and like that they had all these other games, the work was already done emulating them. But at some point the business end of it completely fell apart and that they, you know, everyone who thought they could get away with selling games for five bucks, three bucks, if you wanted it on one platform of $5, if you wanted it on both, I think is what they were doing. Cause it was on PC. Yeah. Or no, it was on Windows Phone. It was on Windows Phone as well. I um, feel like this that potential moment marked a point in video game publishing and development where the lawyers really started to be in the room all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so some of these IP holders were like, no, we want no, we're we're not gonna let you sell it for this amount of money. Like this stuff is easily like if we're gonna do all the work to sign these contracts, it's gotta be at least for this. Um, and and really fucked up a lot of stuff for sure. Uh that's going to do it for news. I, uh, this in television story, I, I just, it's been fun. Not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, I, I'm, I could not help but laugh when I, when I saw it and I wonder what they will rebrand as. Cause like they're out there representing this as like, all right, now around the corner, we're going to finally get these consoles out. Like, no, they're fucking not dude. I, my thing with the Amico is that, like, I, I'm wondering if there is a point at which it crosses over from farce to tragedy. So I think that there's, you know, be, because of the way they did their funding, because they took money from just general people out there on some of these, like, investment websites. Like, you, there's been comments on, I think, Republic or something of someone saying, like, hey, seems kind of weird that you didn't, like, tell the investors on these platforms that you were about to sell the, or that you had sold the IP we had to find out about it in the news and you haven't even bothered to update us here at all. Like I think there are people that are still kind of left holding the bag on some of this stuff and they, it's, they shouldn't be, they should have wised up by now and realized that they have been taken for a ride. Um, I feel bad for the fools that are parted with their money, but it's like, you know, at a certain point, why would you give money to this? I, there are plenty of unsophisticated investors out there. Never, you know, never underestimate that aspect of it. Like, oh, video games are hot right now. That sounds great. And 
I think that that's probably because their whole pitch was like all these video games out there are costing too much money and they're all violent. We want to make something family friendly like the Wii. And there was probably someone going like, oh, we, I remember that. And that was probably like the last time they played a video game. And so they're like, oh yeah, this is good. We got to get in on the ground floor of this. And the Intellivision, I remember that. Those guys are coming back. I'm like, no, no, it's the guy that maybe made the oof noise that was in Roblox. You know, sort of the... a very unkind comparison that I was going to make, <laughs> but maybe I should spare everyone that. <sighs> I just, you know, yeah, I, it's, at some point I don't, you know, the, there's a lot of personal attacks that happen as a part of this. And I, I do try to stay out of that stuff. Lest I be deemed a gaming racist. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but Hey, why don't we get into some emails here? Uh, podcast at guard dot bike is the email address. You can send them in and I will read them. Uh, I think we kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but someone wrote in who someone wrote in anonymously who worked in games media for about six years. And this is a long email. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, I worked in games media for about six years and already burnt out before I hit the age of 30. There you go. Now you're talking. That's your, that's the trajectory. I went from an unpaid intern to a poorly paid part-time writer to a freelance editor until I landed a role as a full-time managing editor for an SEO guide farm. While I was running that website, I knew what we were ultimately doing was somewhat compromising uh, and soul-sucking, but I tried to keep a firm grip on the wheel. Basically, you know, it it led to him hiring um, like 30 freelance writers to work on a lot of guide stuff and, and... originally thought like, hey, this is going to be like a good first stop for people in their games media career. And maybe they can, you know, learn some things and, and tried to kind of keep it on track to where these people were maybe learning something of value along the way. Uh, says I kept getting reassurances from hires up that things were fine. We were the good guys compared to the other networks and the obscene number of websites the company was acquiring was a good thing. Actually. Finally, early last year, I was fired after giving more than two years of my life to the company and not given a solid reason why. Mere weeks later, the company abruptly bid farewell to most of the team I had built. We weren't the only site under that company to suffer this fate. Perhaps managing wasn't for me, but there are many ways I wish that had gone instead. Um, And this person has gone on to actual local reporting outside of games with some, I I, I looked the person up, they're doing some games writing, but, uh, but primarily just doing some local reporting. The gig has its own issues, but I hustled every day making phone calls, transcribing interviews, and getting some damn original reporting done. It's refreshing. And reminds me that my favorite moments in games media was when I was running around PAX and E3 for appointments, asking what I thought were compelling questions. My question, do you think there's any room left in games media with that, for that same investigative hunger, or are we stuck in the minds of SEO content and poorly sourced TikToks? And do games media websites even want anyone with that background at this point in time? I I don't, I think that there's a, a, I think there's a light at the end of this tunnel, but I think the things that have to still get ravaged and ripped apart first, like there's still more to come. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of places that I think have just like never become like a stable enough success that are so dependent on a fickle market. Yeah. That, like it just doesn't make sense to keep them up anymore. And I think that unfortunately there are always some sites that people like genuinely love that I don't know how they make it through the end of 2024. Um, right. And that breaks my heart as someone who like yourself helped co-found a website um, yeah. that was like what I wanted it to be largely. Yeah. Um, first, let me just say like, congratulations on doing local news coverage. Cause that is like how you really make a difference for people. I think right. like doing like local news reporting. It's a much more um, noble thing, I think, than what, especially what games reporting is these days. Um, yeah. But I, I look at it. Yeah. I, I, like you said, I, I think that there's, there's operations that won't make it through the end of the year. I think, you know, obviously we just saw the, the IGN acquisition of all those read pop uh, sites that read never wanted in the first place. They were just yeah. buying Euro gamers event business. And so they've been trying to deal that stuff forever. That's kind of like a weird story just because I think that that is like a data point that looks similar, but is so different from yeah. everything else that we're seeing. Um, yes. And, and in the case of, I, 
So I, I know actually specifically what the thinking was, I think probably behind this person losing their job in a weird case, because I looked up where this person wrote and I was like, oh yeah, I, I met this person at one point, or I met the, the person running this organization at one point. Mm. Um, I think the thing you have is you don't, you have a lot of people out there that none of them care about video games enough to like float it at a loss anymore. Um, that used to be the case, you know, when like what, like Chris Anderson started future in like 85 with an Amstrad magazine is probably because he at least sort of liked the, the Amstrad and liked video games. Right. Um, when GameSpot was founded, it was three people, one tech, one business, one editorial. And I, the business guy, maybe not, but like the guy running editorial loved video games. And so you have people that are in it for what seem like the right reasons at various points throughout history, but eventually those companies get sold. And at some point you've got a bunch of middle managers and, and you've got a bunch of people who don't care about the subject matter. They care about the numbers. And they're like, okay, how big are video games as a business, as a vertical, as whatever, like how much money can we make off of this? And so they don't care. And so you have these like legacy brands that have been around for 10 or 20 years or longer. Um, and you've got people running those organizations or people above the people running those organizations, looking at them and going like, okay, this isn't maybe losing a ton of money right now, but like if I took the money I'm spending on this staff right here, this editorial team and fired all of these people and spent it all again on something more modern on something that is not this legacy brand that is probably never going to break through and suddenly start making 10 times the money it's making right now. Maybe that's a better bet. And so I've, I've talked to people in these positions where they're just like, yeah, you know, I, I'm controlling this thing that's been around for 15 years. It's not going to grow, you know, like it, maybe it'll grow 5% here, 10% there, but it's not going to suddenly do what we as a company want this money to return investment wise. And so they wipe out an entire brand and they go like, let's go hire a bunch of 19 year olds to put and have them post to TikTok because that's probably a better business plan right now. And I don't even think that's a great business plan anymore. But three years ago when I was having conversations like this, that's where some of these people's heads were at. And so I look at that and say, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of websites in that exact position. There are a lot of outlets in that position where they are being managed and run by companies that just look at that aspect of it and go, is this the best we can do as a return on the investment on these people's salaries, on keeping this website up, whatever the tech costs are, should we just flush all of this down the toilet and try to start something new with this money instead? Because at least with another shot, maybe that'll break through and it's grim. Yeah. And for some stuff like SEO farms, like, and, and soon with guides, I think that there are a lot of, unfortunately smart people like that are in charge of these businesses that see what's coming on the horizon. They're like, I can keep the site open for six months and get completely obliterated. Yeah. Once like this thing happens or this thing happens, or we can pull out now. Right. Um, and maybe in some people's case, give some severance, but like, otherwise, like it, this is coming one way or another. Um, and it's, it sucks. It yes. super sucks. It's like a house built on a foundation that has severe problems that there is no, way to fix at the moment because the company that owns all of the concrete is trying to divert concrete to its own thing. Like yeah. the degree to which Google and Facebook have captured advertising and are directing it all toward themselves is I don't know that people fully understand it. And meanwhile, everybody's using ad blockers and nobody thinks it's a problem. Right. Um, like the business models don't make sense for sites that staffed up. Yeah. And you know, now podcasts are having their own issues and video mm -hmm. has its own issues. Like Google owns most of the ad market for video. Um, like there are, just aren't a lot of ways to make money in media, much less a niche media, which is this. Yeah. Because and, and I think when you think about like the guides business specifically that everyone seemed to want to pivot to, that's, you know, that's one AI scrape away from being completely gone. Yeah, I mean that's that's the fear, right? But the question is like, will Google get away with it? And right now, I don't know that they will. Right. Like yeah. they're off to a pretty shitty start so far. Yeah. Um I think that um 
you know, th there are legacy sites that will will maintain uh, that are smart. And unfortunately, for for a lot of people, like what I what people keep saying, IGN, IGN did not buy these websites. Right. Yeah, Ziff bought these websites, yeah. and like G2. under under the umbrella that they created, it's a whole IGN and a bunch of other companies. So you know, um, it's not like Sam Claiborne over at IGN like pulled out his checkbook. Um, but I don't know, like. I think that there are still more people doing this and making a living at it than were when I first started or when you first started. Yeah. Yeah. Problem. Um, yes. Almost certainly. Yeah. Especially if we take into account like individuals that are behaving in a journalistic manner on YouTube or TikTok or some of these other yeah. platforms. Like, yeah, it's, it's probably a much larger number, but it's going to be less than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, yeah. And it's just like at Amazon and Google where they've been working on hardware for years that has lost enormous amounts of money and then suddenly realized we can't keep doing this. Just like Facebook realized that they can't keep flushing billions of dollars away every quarter on VR. Um, yeah. Everybody is trying to right size their ships and that feels like shit. But yeah. uh, there's, no, there's no way to fix the underlying problem right now. Right. And I, I think it's, it's one of those helpless feelings that, that I've felt in a different capacity for sure. You know, some number of years ago where you just go like, there's no article I can write much like with, Hey, there's nothing Xbox can say that can write the ship. Like people that are out there at these publications, like it, it, there's nothing that they can, there's probably nothing they can do to prevent this. There's no article they can write. That's going to result in such a turnaround for that business that it's going to, to matter. I mean, I've. I was at one point in charge of a profitable business and that didn't result in the things that you would think of that you think it might, um, like, Oh, profitable business. We should really invest in that and do this, 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 and this. I was like, yeah, I guess I pitched that a lot of times and got nowhere if, with it. You know, I, I feel like there's this misunderstanding or this sort of ignorance about like, if you're a profitable business making money, you have to keep making exactly that much money. And if you want to grow, then you have to make that much more money. And exactly. if the second that you start making less, then you're in the red. Yep. Um, yep. And so a business that only pays for itself is not sustainable. Yeah. And a business that only pays for itself is one of those things that's very ready to, like I said, in some cases, you're like, well, if this is a zero sum game, let's spend this money on something. Let's place this bet somewhere else and see if we can make it matter more. See if we can yep. strike gold here and get five times our return. That's why I think you see a lot of publications going like, well, we're going to build our AI division because it gives them something to talk to shareholders about and, and helps there, but also is something that they could theoretically do for not a lot of money, not a lot of manpower for sure. And, yeah. uh, and try to make happen. So yeah, it, it's, I, I, it, it is, it, it's, it's bad. I don't know. Like I, I, it's bleak. It's, it's not, a, it's, it's not a good forecast. I don't think this is, I, we're still not going in a good direction. I think there has to be some kind of massive reset across a lot of things on the internet for this stuff to happen again. And I think that we will get there, but every development seems to be pushing that further out where you look at all this AI stuff now and go like, Oh, it's going to take a number of years for this to work its way through. And we'll figure out what actually settles and what makes sense and what en ends up going away. Um, how much of it is a scam, how much of it is a grift and, and how much of it sticks. It's funny because in some ways it's like the games press specifically is less exploitative than I think it ever was historically. Like, mm. because the idea of permalancers was present across a lot of places, especially, you know, like right. one up like people have very fond remembrances of oneup.com and all the one-up mm -hmm. shows and all that stuff. But so many people on those shows and working at those sites were interns, like yeah. making almost nothing. Yeah. And now places don't really get away with that. Right. Like there's intern culture at other media places, but games remarkably have gotten away from a lot of that. There are like perma contributors that don't make very much money, but like generally staff positions at gaming websites pay way more than they did. Yeah, um, I, I remember, I don't know what it, what it's like there anymore, but um, there was a lot of contract people at GameSpot kind of coming in and out, especially in, in the behind the scenes video positions and, and, and stuff like that. And 
so it was a situation of just like, well, is this contract going to get renewed? And that became this like twofold question of like, well, legally, can we renew it? Or is that going to look bad from an employment? Like, you know, do we have to hire this person now? Because if we do, the answer is definitely no. But can we just renew this contract and not pay the benefits and like do this? And, and I think a lot of businesses were running that way then. Um, yeah. And yeah, fewer positions, but hopefully better ones for now. But I, I do think that there are a lot of people in staff positions right now that will not be there in 18 months. Um, not, not at, at, at any publication that's not specific to, to any, anyone really. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's find another email here. That was upbeat. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, it's just, uh, I, it's, it's the sort of thing that I, I think a lot of people do, do ask about. And, and I, uh, I feel very privileged and very lucky to be able to maintain this very small operation right now. And, and I think initially when I started thinking about going out on my own, which, uh, three days ago was the renewal date on the first domain I registered for what I thought was going to be the new business I was starting. And then I, I got cold feet on the name and ended up never using it. And, but I just got the domain like registration on it. I was like, Oh yeah, right. That thing. Ugh. Um, but when I first started thinking about it, it, it was a, it was a much different type of operation. And it was like a question of just like, is this something that we go out and get funding for? Is this something that, you know, like, like what's this look like? And very quickly, none of that made sense anymore. And so it was like, I, I feel very, very lucky to be able to kind of, I, I view it as kind of like weathering a storm. Um, like I very want much. to do more, uh, but right now some of that stuff is maybe fiscally irresponsible, like the size and scope that I'm thinking of. And so like running this and being able to, you know, like patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman, you know, go sign up and, and, you yeah, got my money already, and, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, come on. Just, I upgrade the tier. Um, no. Um, well, like don't, being able to don't make me look up how much money I give you a month. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it, it, you know, it's been it's been wonderful doing this, and and uh, it, it's been actually really fun to do it solo. Actually, uh, I, I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. But there is still like a part of me that's just like. I want to get to the other side of this when there is interest in these types of properties again, because I do think there will be increased interest in, in that sort of thing. And I feel like I've got something there. Uh, when, There's when a real, the comes. The, I, this will probably actually make you happy, which, you know, far be it for me to try that. You've got a real drive time radio feel to the podcast. Thank a lot you. Of the time that doing is, it solo. That is the, literally the, the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm old enough to have actually like listened to radio when it was yeah. like that. So, um, so much so that I think about putting an audio bed under it and I've gotten that feedback a couple of times because being alone, sometimes you are looking at the next email and there's a bit of, bit of a pause and people go like, I thought the podcast broke. I'm like, well, should I put a little bit of music under the whole thing? I don't know. Like royalty free uh, or, you know, I, yeah, I could go out and commission something or, or, oh. you know, um, and, and just have something. Tom Sharpling, who does the best show, he always has a, a bed under him and it's always the same music. And sometimes you find that monotonous and crazy, or sometimes you find it like this is just the, the warm sound of that show. Personally, I like the suspense of not knowing whether or not you're yeah. just taking a breath or a glass of water or like mm -hmm. a child has completely disrupted your entire workflow. <sighs> the, the door locks. So generally speaking, uh, it's usually it's usually not that. But these days, these days, you never know, especially my daughter's out of preschool now, so now she's just home. Oh, no. uh, and uh, she's already super bored. We've got her signed up for all these classes and and dance classes and l something called Lego Camp, which I don't even I don't even know what that is. <laughs> See, you're turning into Walter Matthau right in front of my eyes. Pretty much, like, man. It, it's yeah. it's super. It, it, honestly, that that it's been really fun being a parent. Is as is, is weird as that sounds. Um. Uh, was There's got to be a reason people do it. Exactly. Yeah. So it, but maybe that's a weird way to describe it, but it has been f super fucking fun <laughs> to like raise kids and, and watch them become little people. It's also terrifying in equal measure because you're like, oh no, these people are going to become people, people. And I need to do what I can to make sure they become good people, people, because that's straight up on me. At a certain point, oh. people are going to hold you responsible. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and that's, 
terrifying. Um, but just to, to go back to the Patreon thing, like I, I think that running it by yourself is like the best bet hedge that you can make because like, obviously like you're doing well with it. You know, I don't think that's a secret. I think people can see like a rough idea or like see how many people are in your discord. I mean, look at, look at this wonderful yeah. like, set decoration. That's, I mean, that's you know, clearly, you know, yeah, exactly. You don't just, this is a fall out of the sky. Um, but like, you never know when, you know, like when the, when the storm will either get better or when it will get worse. Like yeah. you at a certain point, like you can't operate like the rug will never get pulled out from under you and then try to react to that. Like having not a nest egg, but like a contingency is so critical. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's it, yeah. Like this is stuff that I, I look at and go like, okay, this, this is for kind of kind of future development. Um, and you know, eventually maybe hiring people down the line, but it's all, you know, you kind of keep it fluid to make sure that it's not, you know, last thing you want to do is fire somebody, lay somebody, somebody off. I don't even want to give somebody an employee review. Being a manager is tough, man. I, I, I never much cared for it. Honestly, it was never, it was never my thing. They tried a couple of times to see if I was the least bit interested in moving into that like full time or whatever. And I, I just, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to not talk about video games. I feel like everyone that, that took that, you know, the, the John Davison's of the world, the people that, that like got out of the parish Schneiders. Yeah, exactly. Parent. Yeah. Like people that, that eventually kind of ascended into those management roles and stuff. Like you don't see him as much. And maybe that speaks to me and my nightmarish ego, but, um, I like doing this part of it. I don't like doing that other part of it. And so it always just kind of made sense to keep doing this. Your uh, ego distracts me for two and a half hours a week. So currently I will accept it. Fantastic. Um, Anders writes in from Norway and he asks, how common was fall damage in the eight bit and 16 bit era? I was born in 88 and didn't get a video game system until 98. My experience with the old school video games is limited. Yeah. Fall damage. I feel like comes into and out of like Donkey Kong doesn't have fall damage. If you fall at all in Donkey Kong, you just die. Yeah. Was um, it, I don't feel like it was in a lot of PlayStation games either. Yeah, I guess not. I, you know, cause I mean like the, the 3d games on PlayStation, there wasn't a lot of, if it was either all platforming, which meant instant death, if you fail a jump or right. you weren't jumping. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think like, you know, actual damage and not just death because you do have stuff like donkey kong or spelunker or or whatever where it's just like hey you you fell off this ledge and you're you're done um at some point it's just one of those situations where games became realistic in a way that fall damage like not having fall damage seemed insane where you're just like oh but like gta 3 jumping off a building and landing on the ground and shooting some people like okay that that doesn't like you have to have some consequences here because yeah. otherwise it's, it's too reality breaking, but fall damage is not a fun thing in games. It's not like games are not necessarily made better for it outside of realism. Um, but yeah, com it was not super common. I, I will say this as someone who is like, you know, put on the stupid consultant head again. I apologize everybody. It, it does <laughs> give like another valve to turn. Like in in mm. sort of like complex game mechanic, yeah. Like relationships, like it is a way to sort of like work with the player or give them something to work against or give you something to design against. So I I get that, but no, it's no fun. It always sucks. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, you you have to at some point. You can't just have players just jumping. Like I said, GTA three style. Like you can't just have them jumping off buildings and landing and, and, and doing whatever that it definitely didn't work sense. out for GTA three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, no one remembers that game. Yeah. Well, that, I think, I think they did have fall damage. I mean, I, I'm not saying that they didn't have it. I'm saying like, could you disable it? You could cheat and disable everything yeah. at some okay. point. So, so that's, yeah. Um, and it makes games without fall damage stick out like crackdown. I don't think had fall damage and that just right. made falling yeah. from the top of building. Awesome. Yeah. Like saints row and stuff like that, where they just go for the superhero route with it. Like it, it help, helps those games stand out for sure. But yeah, super Mario 64 had fall damage. Mm. Um, but games in the 16 bit era and eight bit era didn't necessarily have a ton of it that I can think of. Like what someone in chat says, uh, says blaster master. 
had that apparently. Does Monster Master have really? Yes. When you're when you're out of the car and you're just a little dude, you do take fall damage when you fall, and it sucks. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. But on the other it, you, hand, know, you can throw a grenade at a guy and pause the game, and it kills him. Right. I mean, that's just real. Yeah. Um, let's take one more email here. Uh, from Eric here it says, feels like this idea gets thrown around a lot in some aspect on the podcast every other week, but do you think the rising cost of producing AAA titles is caused mostly by studios targeting 4K resolutions for their games? And if so, uh, does this cost potentially fall in the next console generation because of diminishing returns and, and whatever else on, on hardware? Do you think that once everyone staffs up and gets good at making games at this scale that eventually that aspect changes? Or I guess my other question that I would tack onto this for you is, do you think that there's any way for any developers to walk it back? The other thing I see a lot of people asking is like, well, why don't they just target 1080? Wouldn't that save them a bunch of money? Like what if Spider-Man was a 10, you know, ran at 1080p and, and, and they didn't have to pursue all these high res assets. Games are, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's not resolution that costs money. It's time. Time is what costs money. Yeah. Like and time. So, and number of people and amount of development time. Like, so I think the idea there is like, you know, if you're only making assets at 1080p instead of 4k, can you make them faster? No, not really yeah. at this point. And it's, cause I think, it's, yeah, cause there's most it's, assets it, are made in such like higher detail than you ever see them. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know. Have you heard of this thing called AI? Jeff? No, what's that about? That's, it sounds, sounds great. Um, it's where a, a robot lies to you. And it costs like enough energy to power a house every time you'd ask it a question. I um, love it. I I think that there are ways to decrease development budgets. This is what I hear mm -hmm. and what has been suggested to me based on what I read and hear on the internet and in conversations that like there are ways to decrease development budgets and ways to decrease development time. But like scope is a big thing and cut content is a big thing and feature creep is a big thing. And all of these things are made out of like bad planning or fear of mm -hmm. a market or like there are a million reasons why games take as long as they do. Um, right. But scope is like a big one. And I think that's where you get games like, you know, Miles Morales being an example of a game that was done to ameliorate the costs of making a game as big as Spider-Man and also right. as big as Spider-Man too. Cause it's like an in-between point between those games. Yes. And also why I fully expect we will see a silk miles Morales spinoff at some mm. point in the next year and a half. But like, uh, I think, you know, we didn't talk about Hellblade because you know, whatever, uh, but Hellblade right. I think is actually a really good example of this. And like, there's a lot of conversations about, well, well, do they feel safe? Like, you know, how do you feel if you're Ninja Theory with all this Arcane Austin stuff and, yeah. you know, like Tango stuff? And the thing is that, like, Hellblade was in development for around 40 months with a team of between 70 to 80 million, 70 to 80 people. Mm -hmm. And that, in and of itself, like, that puts your development budget, like, if you estimate like 100,000 per developer. Right. Like that's a true development budget somewhere between like 30 and $40 million, which is not a hundred million dollars, which is right. like table stakes for almost any upper tier double a or lower tier triple a game. At this and they point. probably got a lower marketing spend than some of the biggest triple a games because, you know, being on game pass, like it's a, it's a different, they market yep. those games a different way because they don't have to go out there and acquire exactly pre-orders or whatever. Yeah, because it's not a physical game, so you're not trying to drive an awareness campaign to get people yeah. into a physical place. Um, and then on the other end, you have Spider-Man 2, where like it was in development for a really long time, like give or take five years, mm -hmm. with like a ton of people. And not only did development cost supposedly around $300 million, but then they spent like $150 million on advertising for it. Right. And And like I... Is that and, what Dis and Disney gets some chunk of every dollar they get back. Disney gets so much. And the more yeah. that, that Spider-Man two sells, the more money Disney gets from every copy. Um, that seems like a scary con. That seems like a bad contract to sign. I think it's to keep their peace when prices go down. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. and yeah. they also get a chunk whenever, you know, a box with Spider-Man inside it sells mm -hmm. and Insomniac is in California. And, but, and like, you know, Spider-Man two is a, so like the, the gaming community considers a success, but like Sony laid off a bunch of people from that team. 
because that it's just so much money. It's so yeah. much money. And so, you know, is Hellblade what everybody wanted? No. Like, does Hellblade was Hellblade so expensive that it needs to be? I don't think so. And are there ways to make games cheaper? Yeah. But the question is like whether or not those are games people want to play. Right. And so when you start cutting scope and stuff like that and making I, I, a lot of people are very quick to say, I want smaller games for more money and I'm not joking. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's around the edges. You see cool. people making statements like that. But I think by and large, I think if you started trying to voice that onto the mainstream buying public with some of these more, yeah. some of these larger franchises, I think that doesn't go down as smoothly unless you're cutting price, unless you're in Hellblade was, you know, that when they were selling copies of it, like on steam, it's 50. So they're not even necessarily yeah. charging like full price for it, uh, anywhere. So it's not necessarily like a great example of, of some of this stuff we're talking about, but like if they made smaller Spider-Man games more frequently, they still have to make New York. And yeah, when they, when they eventually make a standalone Spider-Man two spin off, which yeah, of course they'll, they'll have to they'll almost have to do it. Right. It's because those assets are there already and because they can leverage a, a, some of that stuff, a second or fourth, whatever if you want to. And at what point is, is it good enough? You know? And like, right. maybe we're at that point. Cause like, I don't look at Hellblade two and think this could, these assets could be better. Um, right. Yeah. That's the, 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 the one thing I will say, I, I find that has going for it is that I think it looks incredible. It's, it's um, jaw dropping all the time. And I think, you yeah. know, that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed it, but like, Anything that makes games faster to make with less time waiting for iteration to be visible mm -hmm. and, you know, allows people to get stuff out faster, like anything like that will lower the budget of a game. Unless the way that they're doing that is by using more people, which right. is like that has been the Ubisoft and Activision strategy for years right. now. It's like, well, we could take four years to make an Assassin's Creed game or three years, or we could use... 7,000 people to finish it in two years. Yeah. Um, and they just hire a whole management layer devoted to outsourcing, like managing all their outsourcing needs and, and, yeah. and everything else. And yeah, it just, yeah. Like it, productivity doesn't scale like with number of people. It actually like the, the per employee productivity goes down because management is a thing mm -hmm. and coordination is a thing. And so yeah. I, as games become like too big to fail, they take more and more money to keep on track. And that is a huge problem to say nothing yeah, I, of like scope changing. Right. And, and I think that's why it's interesting that, you know, you find Sony doing this with these games that don't monetize on the back end in terms of skin sales or some of this other stuff, you know, it, it, it made a ton of sense, even if it seems like that they've maybe, they're maybe having second thoughts about some of it. But when Sony said, Hey, we want to have more live service games. I was like, yeah, I bet you do for the, for the yeah. amount of money you're spending on some of these games and you're kind of just getting the purchase price out of players. Like I see why they would want to have more games that they might be able to just like reliably more, maybe not reliably, but to be able to monetize for five years, seven years, whatever it is, if, if they get a hit out of it. Um, but a lot of those games are still taking the ascent, exactly. essentially the equivalent of a triple a game budget to yeah, make. Exactly. And that is, that's, that's just like, that again puts so much pressure on the bet you're making and if it's free to play then it's so much pressure to be huge yeah. right away instead of building right. an audience you know and like i don't know if i were herman holst at sony mm -hmm. i would say everybody makes mid cools like every game gets a spinoff using the primary tools and assets from the last game so we can like reap more investment on this game and yeah. also shore up our first party release calendar because right now the sony first party release calendar is rough and I know that people are waiting for a say to play this week. I don't think that they're going to hear what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, which is that like, they, I don't, they don't have enough teams to release games at the cadence they've been releasing them. And the only reason they had such a murderer's row of stuff hit on the PS five is because they were delayed PS four games. Right. Uh, and yeah, it seems like they kind of, they, they burned through a lot of that and had the success that they were going to have. And, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, I think that's part of why this, all this PS5 pro talk is so crazy to me. So like, what are you going to ship on that thing? And I guess when the PS4 pro was coming out, when the PS4 pro got leaked and then announced, I don't remember them being in the middle of an amazing year. I don't remember them, them like having amazing games to go right alongside the launch of the pro like third parties were patching their games. 
and and you were seeing some of that stuff so take the advantage games, of it but the first games i remember playing on ps4 pro that got pushed really hard were Watch Dogs 2 and dishonored 2 right um they showed off horizon mm -hmm. on it but i don't did that come out before or after i think was that, that was out before so that that was them i think promoting the patch yeah. Mass Effect Andromeda, someone dark to to the says chat. That's another one, yeah, for sure. Oh, great! All right, um, yeah. yeah. But like again, like we're we're talking about a lot of third party games that will ship everywhere, you know, and yeah. and so I, it just doesn't, you know, if if Sony's going to go roll out new hardware at the same time that 2017 was Horizon, apparently. Okay. Okay. It's delayed. I Got see. it. Okay. But I guess, you know, at the end of the day, if they're just looking to sell new consoles to the super enthusiasts that want to have the newest latest, they don't necessarily have to have a great software lineup for it because those people yeah. will, will buy it and play whatever, you know, like Call of Duty will more reliably run at 120 hertz and GTA 5 will probably run better and Fortnite will maybe run better and maybe, maybe that's all they need. PS5 Pro is for people who should know better. Yeah. Which, That's how I felt about the PS4 Pro, but like... But that had happy. a use case. Like, 4K was a thing. HDR was a thing. But they didn't hit it. Like, it, you know, like yeah, it was, but like all their weird checkerboarding stuff and, and every bit of technology they put in it, like, it still never really felt like... I don't remember launching a game on that and being specifically impressed with the way the resolution aspect of it played out. You it know, looked getting better. It did look better. But it wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't go replace your console better, except for people who should have known better, like me. Yeah. I was yeah, very excited exactly. to, yes. Uh, but, yeah. you know, again, for people who are not us that buy a PS5 Pro, they will give their PS5 to somebody else, and that will then be another person to buy PS5 games. Yeah. Um, and so in that way, it's a win-win for Sony, just like every new model of the switch that they put out for that Nintendo mm -hmm. puts out is like an opportunity for a person who didn't have a switch before to have it, not because they're getting a new one, but because the person who gets the new one who compulsively buys everything will give their switch to someone else. And I know this cause I did it twice. Yeah. Mine have all stayed in the household because my, my daughter likes to play Mario Kart. That switch light that we have here is the grimiest piece of technology yeah. that I have. It's got cheese dust caked around the buttons and just like it is, uh, the screen is a mess, but that thing still works perfectly. Like I, you hear all these yeah. stories about like Game Boys and like guys that were deployed with a GBA and came back and was full of sand, but it still worked. And just all the like, oh, this fell out of a burning building and this DS is still perfect. And the Desert Storm Game Boy was like one of the first stories in Nintendo Power. That's right. The Game That's... Boy that got like hit by yeah. like a mortar attack or something, or run over by a tank, and like it still worked. And they had yeah. it in the the Nintendo New York store for a real long time. Oh, that's awesome. Um, maybe they'll move it to the San Francisco store for a while when that finally opens. They also announced plans to do that. Yeah. Which uh, now that I don't live in San Francisco, I don't care. God damn it. Um, though I haven't been to their theme park that's down here either, so. Maybe I'm not the guy God, either way. I, I really wish I could take my nieces to that. That looks pretty neat, honestly. We're just about, my daughter's about to turn five. And so we're, she's just on the, my oldest rather. Uh, it, so I, we're, we're on the cusp of her being able to ride rides and, and do cool stuff. The first time you take those kids to Disneyland is going to be truly magical. We're going. I hate saying that. Uh, she, but... she, went, she went last year for her birthday. But, oh, okay. Um, but she was too young to do most stuff. So instead it was like, they do a princess breakfast where you get to eat with princesses and take a mm -hmm. bunch of pictures and, and she still talks about it. So we're, we're taking, we haven't told her, but we're taking her back for her birthday this year no. and we're, but we're bringing everybody. My son will be just about three at that point. And so he will not be equipped. I don't know. My, when, when I went to Disneyland, I, I was probably six or seven and my dad took me on space mountain and it ruined me. Um, yeah, I, I, might have traumatized my niece taking her on Splash Mountain. Yeah, and so I, I'm thinking about like when can I take my boy on something and really fuck him up the same way <laughs> that my dad did to me. Um, he took me to see a 3D movie called Parasite where people explode and turn inside out. One of the first movies I remember seeing at an incredibly young age. Oh man, and, my whole childhood is full of seeing movies I wasn't supposed to see. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, you know, we had HBO, like, so it was yeah. 
it was over but aliens when i was five like robocop and the fly when i was yeah. six perfect one more you know it's just you know you gotta you gotta season a child to make sure they know what the world's really about i was very particularly seasoned <laughs> all right well that's gonna do it for us arthur thank you for joining me today uh it's been a, a long time coming i think we talked about this at the last we summer did games fest well it's not like your life had anything going on yeah exactly so you know keeping it keeping it easy going i guess i, but, I uh, should see you next week i think yes yeah i'll be i'll be there seeing something seeing some video games doing some stuff so yeah hopefully i'll see you and i'm looking forward to to seeing what's there for sure um where can people find you on the on the internet? Is it rebel.fm? Is that the best? Like you know, uh, on your own social media, no. obviously, but we're rebelfm.lipson.com because okay. there is hilariously an Australian radio station called Rebel uh, FM. Yeah. Which is funny. Um uh and I'm on Twitter at A E G I E S and on right. basically everything. I'm Blue Sky I'm, included. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm on that as well. All right. In that bubble. Um, thanks everybody for watching. I'll be back tomorrow to do something online with some video games. I'm not sure what yet. I gotta, I gotta sit down and figure that out. And then Friday we'll rank some 8-bit Nintendo games as we do. I'll be back next Tuesday for the podcast. Until then, see you next time.